Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Mad Mamluks. I'm Mahi and I'm joined by my co host Sheikh Hamer Saeed and Sim. Before we start today's episode, as usual, uh, we've got to give some respect to our sponsors since they help us pay the bills around here. Halfardeen.com, your private matrimonial site for singles who want to mingle. Right now, monogamy only options. Hopefully, we can upgrade that later. <laughs> Wahid Invest for your halal investing needs. Uh, minimum investment of $100 can get you going there. And then for your legally compliant, Islamically compliant, as well as uh, Sharia compliant, will uh, one stop shop, mywasia.com. And we've got a code in the show notes for that. So this morning we are blessed. Oh, before we start, patreon.com slash under forward slash the Mad Mom looks for donating to Patreon. Um, even a dollar a month, if you, whatever you can do, it helps us out greatly. So appreciate your contributions on Patreon. Make sure to like and subscribe to the video. And if you guys have any thoughts, um, make sure you comment and let us know in the description below. Or sorry, in the comment section below. All right. So our guest today is Dr. Abdullah bin Hamid Ali, um, who is a faculty at Zaytuna College. He's, his background, he's got a bachelor's degree from the Kairouin Kairawain University in Fez, Morocco in the Islamic law and a master's and PhD from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. Um, I've always known Sheikh Abdullah more as like the resource of Maliki Fiqh. I remember when I decided to follow the Mental of Imam Malik about, was it 10 years ago now? There's very few, like Lamp Post Productions was one of your first things. Now, I understand that Sim here understands him from because I didn't know you were big on Twitter, you were active on Twitter. And you were asking me some questions last night about like how you're perceived in the community, and I was like, oh, maybe there's another layer of Sheikh Abdullah that I'm not really familiar with. <laughs> and I got a little bit of vibe because we had a chance to go to dinner and whatnot, and mm -hmm. meet meet mm -hmm. some good brothers and have some conversations. But mm -hmm. first of all, welcome to Sh welcome back to Chicago. Yeah, alhamdulillah, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. It's an honor having you. Sure. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. So mm -hmm. you're from like you were born here. Actually, I was born in Philadelphia, and immediately after I was born, my family moved to Chicago. Okay. And um, so I spent my first almost 12 years in Chicago. I used to live up on uh, 122nd Princeton Street, um, is, south side. Is that the Wild 100s? Uh, yeah. Roseland? Yeah. Is that Roseland, right? <laughs> yeah, in that area, the Roseland yeah, area. Yeah. Right? Halstead, yeah. Okay. In that area. And um, so in 84, we moved to Philadelphia. Then been, I was in Philadelphia from that from that time okay time on here, so. yeah i'm doing the math on your age right now <laughs> <laughs> that year yeah. Yeah. so um were you are you born into a muslim family um my parents they uh, may, may they rest in peace they they actually uh came through the nation of islam through the uh, what we call the first resurrection and the followers of elijah muhammad and then after he passed away they followed imam wd muhammad and uh, in that sense, um, yeah, my, my parents were Muslims. Yes, um, and but we, when by the time I was born, um, uh, that it was it, it, in our house, it wasn't it wasn't a big thing in that, you know, we weren't being indoctrinated into the um, the you know, I, um beliefs. Uh, but my father did pray. He did make salah. He was the only one who prayed, and so we were we identified as Muslims. We, you know, knew assalamu alaikum. Uh, first time I actually saw Quran was probably when I was thirteen. Um, you know, so um, in that sense, um, yes and no. I mean, if more, I would say we were more raised like cultural Muslims, and, um, and it was it wasn't until we moved to Philadelphia that I started. I mean, some of my siblings started to study. Um, some Islam, we actually found and met a, a Sunni family in the neighborhood um, who actually was a break, break dancer, you know, and okay. that sort of led, what led to that. And so, we, you know, they invited me in one day and, you know, I was there with my crew and we were battling the Muslims. And so then the mother of the house found out that I was a, uh, I was a Muslim. So she invited me in and then she, I saw them, they were performing Salat. And, you know, but my mother and father had broken up by this time, you know, and I just remember my father used to pray and it really attracted me, so I started to come around, and, and this really started from that point. Simply, just just the salah attracted you to towards mm -hmm. Islam more. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's yeah. insane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've heard a lot. Of, you know, I think we take it for granted a lot. I, I've heard a lot of non-Muslims literally say that when they see us pray for the first time, mm -hmm. they. I remember we had some. I had some, uh, f you know, coworkers over a couple of years back, and we had to pray 
my wife and I for Isha, mm-hmm. and they were like, "Can we watch?" I'm like, "Sure." And they were like, "That was like the most profound thing they've ever seen." Yeah, mm-hmm. it's strength mm-hmm. and submission, man. They mm-hmm. see that you're submitting at such a level that it gives you a certain type of power, right? In the eyes of the people, it's, it's mm-hmm. the best way to submit to Allah, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So, so then, so then you go to Temple for college, right? For a couple of years. Right. Exactly. Well, actually, yeah, I, I was I was already studying Islam, and I, I I was studying Arabic. I knew Arabic, and then I went to Temple University, and and when I first registered for Temple University, I was mastering in computer science. Mm. And, uh, you know, it didn't take very long for me to realize that, you know, it wasn't really the path that um, that, that suited me. Uh, I was focused the first year, the second year, you know, I discovered the Arabic section of the library. And then I started to, you know, spend a lot of time there, I started to fall behind in my computer science studies <laughs> and then, uh, decided eventually that, you know, I need to go overseas and, and, and do what I felt that I could excel at a bit more. It was in my heart. And so. Morocco was the first place you went? Yeah, well, yeah, Morocco was the only place I went, actually. Um, I, I couldn't co- afford to go anywhere, any other place. Uh, I wasn't as privileged as a lot of other people who, people were who, uh, you know, had people supporting them. I did have a um, some support from Philadelphia. Um, I'd had a re- regular stipend from a, a local um, um, organization uh, in Philadelphia at the time, you know, but I didn't have enough money coming in that I could get up and move, go and travel to Syria, go mm-hmm. to Yemen, go to Egypt, like a lot of other people who are coming yeah. through Morocco were doing, you know, so, and, and I don't regret not having the opportunity to go to other places, uh, but I do think that um, it has sort of, um, um, led to uh, me not having a certain certain type of camaraderie that a lot of other people, you know, who've had those experiences have had. You know? mm. Are you the first American to study at the Cairoine? No, I'm not the first American to study there. I mean, the first that we know of is uh, Abdul Hadi um, uh, Kenneth Honekamp, who actually teaches at Georgia Tech. Um, he studied in Kulia Tuluga, uh, the language college in Marrakesh, um, and uh, he's an older brother. Probably, he's probably around 70 years old now, you know, but he was a graduate, the first graduate I know of from the Qadawiyin. And, uh, but I'm the first to graduate from the uh, Sharia College, called Sharia in Fez. Uh, So, um, yeah, so I I usually tell people that, you know, I'm the first from the Sharia College, but not the very first um, American to to study there. So what is it about Um, Morocco that, um, because I think, you you mentioned that maybe financially it was e- it was like easier, in that sense. Uh, was there a scholar? Was it a stipend? Is it like living cost? Because like to, for us, a lot of us we're like well, I, we Yemen. We think Yemen is like cheap, right? No, it is compared to Morocco. Morocco is actually expensive compared to compared to, compared to Yemen or compared okay. to Egypt. And uh, and going to Morocco really it wasn't it wasn't so much my choice. It it was I was t- at Temple. I was studying with Dr. Khalid Blankenship, who was a well known historian, at least you know among certain American scholars. And um, and when I so when I made the decision that I wanted to go overseas, I went and talked spoke to him. And I said, "Yeah, what do you think?" So he told me, "Yeah, you know, we probably should go to Morocco, you know, and because we don't know anybody who studied there." And I just follow his advice, and that's really how it happened. I gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So prior to that, I had we used to study, read books together in his office. We were studying Maliki fiqh. He originally was a Hanafi, and he became a Maliki. And then, uh, you know, we started to study some of the commentaries together in his office, and, and then, you know, just sort of one thing led to another, and I ended up in Morocco. It's Mashallah. sort of like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, what brought you to town, to Chicago, and? I'm sorry about the snow. Uh, what brought me to Chicago yeah. like, this, this weekend? Well, what brought me to Chicago this weekend was uh, Zaytuna in, in your community program, uh, which was uh, in um, conjunction with Dado Qasim. Uh, we had a program related to um, uh, sort of comparisons between uh, um, the um, academy and um, traditional uh, Islamic uh, studies. And, um, you know, so yeah, it was, you know, it was, uh, I felt it was a, Good, good event. Yeah, Sheikh Amin's doing some yeah. great work. Sheikh yeah, Amin great, mashallah. Yeah, mm-hmm. he's a mm-hmm. uh, he's a gem. He's been on our podcast before, mm-hmm. but uh, when he talks about education and schooling and academies and mm-hmm. and institutions, mashallah, mm-hmm. he has such a beautiful breakdown. Mm-hmm. The, the school that I teach at, he's our consultant for our Islamic studies yeah. department. No, he's a beautiful yeah. man. A beautiful yeah, man. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. yeah. I met Very him first deep. in D.C. Um, I think it was early, either earlier this year, or late last year. Yeah, we we were together at a program in in D.C. Um, at a uh, um, conservative th- think tank. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. I, 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 I think that's the, that's the one. Uh, R- R- Royer was involved in that one, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> All right. Exactly. Yeah, I remember he was he was, mm-hmm. he was he was telling us about that. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, like, the whole academic um, 
I, I don't. One of the questions one of the brothers had afterwards is like, mm. there seems to be a different approach to epistemology, like the philosophy of like knowledge. Is that the philosophy of like learning or knowledge? Mm -hmm. you, or, did I, did I it's, that a, it's the study of knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Mm. how we learn versus yeah. ha, um, in the academic sphere versus the the, the madrasa system, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, can you comment on like what what the differences are for the layperson if they you know because a lot of times. Mm -hmm. We had a episode. Um, mm -hmm. You were, we were talking offline about one of the shows that like we got some flack because um, we didn't allude to this individual's Islamic scholarship, but their scholarship was like from a PhD from like sep mm -hmm. a Western institution. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, we I, I think on our platform when we talk about scholars, we think ulama, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Like so, let's say if it's a, like a non-Muslim Orientalist scholar who's got a PhD in Islamic studies, we would call him an ulama. And mm -hmm. so similarly, someone who's like maybe of a progressive slant and studying like gender studies in the realm of Ibn Arabi, I'm just making that up, <laughs> Ibn Arabi at like Princeton, I don't know that we would call them. And so there's a lot of flack for that. So people, but, but they, but the lay people think it's, they're scholars. They're like, mm -hmm. well, they got a PhD, they're a scholar, right? Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit? Like, I seem there's, there's like a mm -hmm. disconnect. You follow what I'm saying? Yes, right, right. Uh, and before before you do, I I would just want to say, mm -hmm. it was kind of my decision on why I didn't in, because I first emailed the, the the guest for their bio. I'm like, hey, can you send your bio? But then I saw that the guest referred to them as themselves as an Islamic scholar, and I'm like, wait, this is problematic. Or we have a lot of younger listeners. They don't mm -hmm. exactly know how to discern right. between what Islamic scholarship is and mm -hmm. uh, being a scholar of certain studies related to Middle Eastern, re studies. Middle Eastern or religious yeah. studies um, or some aspects of, of Islam. Mm -hmm. Calling them Islamic scholar could equate them to that. And I felt like it would be irresponsible for me to include that. And that's why right. I, I left that out. But mm -hmm. that caused an uproar among mm -hmm. their their viewership or their listeners. Mm -hmm. I think she was upset a little bit about it as well. So, mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts about it? Well, I think the 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 issue of epistemology when we that that term itself, and basically we're talking about whether it's the source of people's truth. Uh, what's what's the you know, um, and. Uh, in, in, in that sense, there's not much difference between, I would say, between classical Islamic learning and, and you know, what we call sort of the Western, the West itself when it comes to that, you know, the source of truth, you know, the objective truth, you know, sort of the the five senses, you know, empirical knowledge, there's a reason, uh, you know, of course, we include revelation as a source of truth, you know, as, as Muslims. Uh, but, of course, the uh, when you're trying to distinguish between a classical scholar and a Western scholar, a person with a PhD who studied Islamic studies, uh, I think that one of the basic uh, um, understandings or the basic um, the norms is that individuals who study exclusively in the West uh, it, it are people who uh, oftentimes are not specialized in any particular discipline, which is considered to be a classical Islamic di discipline like fiqh or aqidah or usul or fiqh or hadith, things like that. Uh, um, so unless a person has those uh, that background, then it, it is extremely important for us to highlight that to point this out. Um, generally, studying in Western universities um, um, means that a person um, had studied Islamic history. They studied perhaps Sufism, you know, history of Sufism, um, um, perhaps some aspects of Islamic culture or art, those type of issues like that. Uh, and they are sort of Islamic studies um, topics, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the individual was qualified to give fatwa yeah. Uh, among other things, that so I do think that um, that is a, a a a distinction, you know, between the two particular um, uh, types of of education. Yeah, and I think it's very difficult, um, um, especially for non-Muslims or Orientalists, to get the essence of Islam and Iman and Ihsan mm -hmm. um, through an academic university study, mm -hmm. right? And I'll give you a small example. Um, let's just you can take the madrasa system, you could take the mahdara system in Mauritania. Mm -hmm. You start off with something really, really basic, even as a foreigner when you go there. It doesn't matter who you are, you start off when you're doing Nahu. Let's say you already understand Arabic pretty well, you're going to start off with Nahu. It's a very molecular breakdown. And then you're going to start off with Ar Risala in Fiqh al Maliki. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to move on to another subject, like uh, something in Hadith, you know? Mm -hmm. And you're, what you're doing is you're building the individual from a very 
uh, elementary basis, but yet it's it's a very it's very detailed. Mm. And then the individual is going to go to Khalil, Mukhtasar Khalil, and and start not even getting in, d in depth into tafsir because they want to perfect the the Arabic language and uh, fiqh very very strongly. And then you'll find people going into hadith. So the 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 study which I prefer is w the the Mauritanian way is in the Moroccan way too is where you study one subject at a time and you perfect that subject. When I was in Mauritania and I told people that I want to study like three or four subjects, they're like, no, no, you're not going to be able to absorb everything. Just do one at a time. They actually kind of looked down. And how them. often do you, would you, how long would it take? Like you would start with Arabic, I would assume? You start with Arabic. So for instance, uh, the Metan of Ajrumiya may take you anywhere, depending on how, how sharp or whatever you're given, is anywhere from one month to three months, let's say. Okay. Okay? Yeah. And after you finish that, the Risala will probably take people anywhere from five months to eight months, sometimes even a year. Okay. But they're only focusing on fiqh. Yeah. So imagine somebody's doing that for 10 years, 12 yeah, years. Yeah. Now imagine somebody who got their bachelor's in Middle Eastern studies, yeah. right? We're ah. studying culture. Right. They're studying problematic issues, women's rights, and right? There's no usul al-fiqh. There's no fiqh. And then you, and I'm not, I'm not saying they're that. They're probably reading a lot of. I would assume they're reading other people's works, like other academics' works. Yes, that's so they're not. So that's the the source of knowledge it's is distilled. Different. It's distilled. It's Period. actually not primary sources. Yeah, you know, you're, you're reading secondary. You're not going to yeah, open the Quran. Tertiary sources. So, like, but mm -hmm. when you're doing like, I remember I was talking to uh, Yasser Qadi about this. Like, back when he first started at Yale, he was saying that he had to learn German mm -hmm. for his PhD. Yeah, or like so, so, but that's still like, what's in German? I guess Orientalist studies text and stuff so mm -hmm. so again they're but i think the point is they're, they're going to secondary a lot of secondary sources first yeah mm -hmm. it does make you very thorough in whatever you're specializing in right but it's not going to give you the core base principles and do your tarbiya all the way from step zero mm -hmm. all the way to 10. Yeah. what it's going to do is it's going to give you some elements of muslim culture islamic culture some elements of usul where justice can be made between certain you know uh, elements in the Sharia, you have to be very critical sometimes of Muhammad You have to be very critical. They're not even going to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're going to say Muhammad. You know, right. the whole time you have right. to get used to mm -hmm. that culture, um, and sometimes uh, have very uh, uh, Orientalist uh, based arguments against Islam. And then that's by the by the time you're done with that, you haven't really tasted the halawat al iman. You know, the sweetness mm -hmm. of iman. Yes, right. That's not there. That ruh, yeah. that spirit's missing. Yeah. So now, if you're claiming to be a scholar, after all of that study, even if you're a PhD and that was your entire training, mm -hmm. how is somebody with traditional Islamic knowledge going to? They'll respect you, and they'll respect your education, but they're not going to see that you have a senad in knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? They're not going to say that you have went through this traditional way of, of learning, and yes, the knowledge you have is passed down from the Imam of Ahl Medina, Imam Malik, from the Sahaba, Abdullah bin Omar, to Nafi'ah, to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're not going to have that Senate. Well, so, yeah, so there's the thing, there's the spiritual development that they talked about, you guys talked about yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. the, pi the piety emphasis, the, mm -hmm. the tarbiyah, right? However, an academic would probably argue that that causes you to be theologically biased. Right, right. Uh, that's the whole thing of like. I, I think that I mean I think there's definitely some there's some truth to some of those claims in that you know you can a lot of dogmatism you know you know they actually refer to like uh, classical or sort of um, the uh, aqidah or creed which is learned from like manuals or sort of uh, or a catechism as like a dogmatic theology. You know, and there's a ten tendency to make people dogmatic. People sort of have, they work with assumptions, pre um, assumptions which have not been proven to the actual student. The student is expected to simply sort of to take them in to uncritically accept them. Mm -hmm. You know, and I do think that there is um, there is some validity to the claim that you know kid makes you a bit biased. There's no, no doubt about <laughs> it. Um, but I, I, for me, I, I don't think so much as the issue is with whether or not the uh, teacher has isnad or among other things, but I do think the question is whether or not this individual uh, knows Islam or just simply knows, some, knows about Islam. You know, and, I, and what I mean by that is, um, if I'm studying Islamic history, I'm studying Islamic culture, civilization, Islamic art, uh, that I'm studying sort of aspects of the religion, you know, that, you know, um, in a sort of 
uh, sociological or anth anthropological sort of study of the religion and, and rather than a normative study of the religion where actually uh, we don't necessarily have to even embrace it as a believer, but at least if you look at a lot of the, um, the early Orientalists even, you know, that many of them, they matched the classical Arabic. They, um, you know, like now, you st university, they study modern standard Arabic, for instance. You know, they not, so a lot of students today are not able to truly access their original sources. Mm -hmm. These older Orientalists, like Joseph Schacht and, you know, and Golzir and these guys, these guys really mastered Arabic. And they could actually go to the sources and actually study them and actually study fiqh. Yeah. You know, like, and we're thinking of somebody like George Moctesi, who wasn't even a Muslim, you know, who actually, you know, people used to say, when I, I remember, I'm from Philly, he used to teach at the University of Pennsylvania, people used to say he's a humbly, <laughs> right, even though he's not a Muslim, you know, but they yeah. they study Islamic law, right, yeah. you see, so, so but the difference between those old Orientalists rather than uh, many of the people who study Islam today, which I wouldn't necessarily term as Orientalist, but they um, uh, definitely, there's a deficiency, but it also there's some drawbacks from the madrasa, you know, sort of type of study as well, because I think that the lack of a critical um, approach to uh, the study of, of, of the, um, the developments and the evolution of Islamic law, among other things, you know, that, that in itself is becomes a crutch. I do think that it, it definitely places madrasa students at a disadvantage, you know, and so one of the credit things that can be credited to the Western Academy is a focus on, you know, being critical. Yeah. Uh, and, and I do think that there's something, some use to be taken from that. So, sure. Mm -hmm. So today, if today's mm -hmm. folks aren't Orientalists, what's mm -hmm. their incentive, like, it's hard for me to process like well, how why a non-Muslim today would do a PhD in Islam. I'm 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 I've heard the job market isn't that great, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, so like, what is it like? Because you hear you I've heard lectures from non-Muslims about like, and they're like obsessed with stuff. Like, there's a, um, I think there's a guy named Michelle Kuyper. She wrote like a tafsir of Maida. Maida. Mm. And I'm like, what? And he's because he's and it's he's like talking about the linguistic miracle of it. I'm like, but he's not Muslim. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's like, why would this dude? It's not his culture. He's a French dude. Mm -hmm. Like, why does he care? Like, what drive to, to, to do a PhD? As you could probably attest to, yeah. is like you must have. Like, it's almost like my friends with a PhD. They're like, you gotta have like a burning desire that you can't sleep to learn about the subject. Mm -hmm. I was like, why would a non-Muslim dude, <laughs> like, be obsessed with like Surtur Maida? for example? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, again, I I can't really. I'm not, I don't want to like sort of. Um, claim to know people's intentions. Right. I do think that um, some people, it could be maybe a sense of compassion. Maybe a, they want to understand Islam better because of everything that's happened since 9-11. Um, I mean, there is a, has been a, 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 a growth, the growth of Islamic studies programs has, you know, has, you know, um, increased, you know, since that time. Yeah. And, and I know a couple of years ago, there are a number of positions that opened up, uh, tenure positions opened up at multiple universities in the United States, like USC, the University of Minnesota, like I mean, Minnesota had a couple of programs related to Quranic studies that had, you know, they were trying to fill those positions. I think they did, you know, the University of Central Florida. Um, Brandeis University, Islamic text, you know, study of Islamic text. I mean, so there, there are positions, job openings that which are available, uh, and um, and um, I think that uh, um, there the, the universities, since most university uh, professors who teach Islamic studies are not Muslims to begin with, you know, that they may actually may be preferable to some of those universities. So you. You, know, you you establish like a certain my, my type of authority. Uh, you have authors like Juan Cole, for instance. You know who right. has this this book about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Him and Majid yeah, Nawaz yeah, just got it on yeah. Twitter. Yeah. So yeah. It's, yeah so it's, um, well, Juan Juan Cole is pretty good. Yeah. 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 yeah it's yeah. very good. Very I don't good, know what yeah. your thoughts are right now, but I follow him pretty closely on Twitter. It's good. <laughs> Yeah. But well, I think, yeah, no, just a minute. No, no, no. no, so there's various reasons. Like, I'll give you an example from Hanafi. But Sir Charles Hamilton, like almost 300 years ago, mm -hmm. he translated the Hidayah of Imam mm -hmm. Abu Hanifa. Okay. And he wanted to translate it for the legal document that it is, mm -hmm. to understand the legal document, to understand what's in it. And they incorporated some of that in the UK, some of, of Imam Abu Hanifa's fiqh, because he saw that the Turks were, in, in, you know, what they were doing and how they incorporated in their courtrooms and even up until now in Egypt and Turkey in the courtrooms Yahab Hanifa's fiqh is used um, you know uh, as, 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 as a legality so there, I've met people in Egypt before you have like 
there's a there's a huge spectrum. There's some people because of kind of like the exotic other type, and they feel the 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 passion of, for instance, in in Arabic poetry, and they fall in love with it. Right. Right. Um, there's some people who are very sympathetic, like you were saying, towards Muslims, and mm -hmm. they want to know more about this culture, and they really make themselves marketable by learning it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's other people that really, really just want to know as old text what it is. Right. And then there's some people who just want to know it so they can add to their toolkit and help. And, you know, for us, it's very difficult to understand sometimes because Islam is very dear to us. It's not a religion. Mm -hmm. Right. Religion is an understatement of what it is, which is why you may have a hard time understanding why somebody would want to. Look what John uh, Esposito has done. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, I mean totally. All the massive work he's yeah. done on Islam. Yeah. You know. yeah. And for us, just think about like somebody who would specialize in uh, Christianity, some elements of Christianity if they're Muslim, right? Mm -hmm. They're like, oh my God, they don't even believe that Jesus, it's actually blasphemous for them that Jesus is God. Why would they want to learn the Bible? But for us, it not only if you have your head on straight, it actually raises your iman, it's actually good for your iman, um, you know, uh, if you're capable of doing so. But someone may be, you know, do you guys remember when Reza Aslan, you know, I don't like to bring this up, but when he's on Fox, and the ladies went back and forth on her for like five minutes, but you're a Muslim, why would you want to know about Jesus mm -hmm. and this and that? And he's mm -hmm. like, he specializes in Christianity, mm -hmm. yeah, right? right? So it's kind of like, you know, I know it, it, it's sometimes hard to grasp, but mm -hmm. sometimes people are just, they just like the knowledge of, Yeah, they have know, the passion. Yeah. I mean, you had Dr. Ali Atai here yeah. on, on your show. I yeah, mean, oh yeah. He's had a passion for study of the Bible exactly. for, for, for a very long time, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Since you brought him up, <laughs> uh, I was going to, like, so th th there's um his show, and I, he, you know, he knows this, is that he has, we got, like, out of he's going to come on again too, though. Yeah, yeah out of, inshallah, 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 like, I think in a few months he'll be back in Chicago, but, um, out of all the shows we've done on like spiritual abuse and like nasheeds about like wolf shakes and yeah. <laughs> feminism, his show got us the most pushback um, because of some of the thing. And and we, we were talking, Sheikh Amr, we were talking about. It, I was like, well, he's an academic. He's throwing ideas out there. Mm -hmm. He's putting out. And sometimes these mm -hmm. ideas aren't like there's not his personal beliefs, right? But he's he a just researcher. Yeah, yeah, he's throwing it out there, but. One of the main complaints that I got from a lot of people in the community was that, yeah, okay, we get he's an academic, but like he shouldn't be broadcasting that on a platform like your guys because lay people are going to listen to it. Well, lay, lay, lay people what? don't listen to us. It, it's a fact. Mm -hmm. Majority of our, our listeners are people who are intelligent people. Now, <laughs> uh, intelligent, I use the term intelligent okay. loosely after that, the, 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 some of the comments I saw because. Um, <laughs> The, here, here's the thing. The, the, a lot of these people, they don't understand that when you are discussing something from an academic perspective, mm -hmm. it, this is not, a, um, you, you have to emotionally detach yourself from yes, some of these ideas. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you have to actually mm -hmm. put aside your biases and, mm -hmm. and actually really look at the matter and, and say like, hey, am I just feeding into something I've been taught? Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of ideas that you don't actually look into why you believe in the the, the things you do and, mm -hmm. and you actually discover that uh, we were like for example we were go going through some of the the stories that were re regarding Omar the on after a recent episode and we were we were looking at some of the things about uh Omar the on's conversion story mm -hmm. and how weak that that the narrations are related to that or that he used to bury his daughters and mm -hmm. they found out that that's complete right. hogwash right. as well mm -hmm. and, and you find out that there's so much stuff that you're just inheriting mm -hmm. from people you trust or things like that and then you never actually do any research regarding it and then it, it eventually becomes a part of you to a six to an extent where um if someone pushes back against that idea you're in it's almost as if your existence is being invalidated yes, exactly. mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. talk to us about that yeah. well i mean think about the prophet still alive he 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 his over his main message to the Mushri King for 23 years was, you know, there's only one God, right? And and it took them that long. I mean, well, what not that long actually, because the first half Mecca was in was year eight after the Hijrah, you know. So you're talking about 18 years, you know, that for them to finally and then some some actually just caving in, you know, because of just the acknowledgement that listen, okay, well we we lost, right? Uh, we have to entertain that possibility that some people still didn't give up their idolatry, you know, but they okay, I accept Islam because, you know, Muhammad's one, he, he's a conquered us. Uh, but, but, but the whole point I'm making is that, that people 
the aqidah is the hardest thing to change in people that once you once they have a belief uh, and is ingrained in them, especially from a very young age, right? That you can't expect for them to change overnight. That it takes time. You have to be patient with them, you know. And 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 people have to work through their emotions, their anger, uh, their anxieties, uh, and then and then eventually, hopefully, they'll open up, you know, to realize like, you know what? All right, um, that is a valid, potentially valid interpretation or possibility, you know, which is there. And so, what I've been taught was maybe the mainstream oh. or the or we become the accepted we call the orthodox view on this issue or the majority view on this issue now with this other view is while it's not popular it does have some strength you see uh and i'm not and i'm just saying in general i'm not talking about anything in particular that dr ali said i don't know exactly what what points you guys are uh, that the people are objected to but but i do think that's an important um uh, factor to consider that aqidah or just beliefs in general, regardless, they can be political beliefs, beliefs, you know, moral beliefs. They just, they, they, you know, but largely I'm talking about theological issues that it takes a long time for people to really come to terms with uh, the fact that they just are following a, an interpretation rather than yeah. the truth. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of emotionally connected ideas, mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on some of the comments? I mean, I know you saw the our feminist episode, and uh, we briefly touched on it earlier, but what were your thoughts regarding that? Um, did you have any feedback regarding some of the arguments that were presented? We we, we kind of used some of these episodes as a template. Mm -hmm. It wasn't so much that, you know, I wanted to... Uh, there were two options. There wasn't... A, a, well, one thing like, okay, well, this can bring some dialogue mm -hmm. with uh, feminists. Maybe there's some misunderstandings and perhaps mm -hmm. uh, we can come to some, co some sort of uh, um, a greater unity between disagreeing Muslims. Mm-hmm. That's a possibility. The other possibility is that, <clears throat> that it'll be a uh, there will be some more disagreements afterwards, and it can pro it can be used as a template for further episodes to come. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I know you heard the episode, and mm -hmm. uh, you had some thoughts regarding. Right various points that were presented mm -hmm. did you have uh, any feedback regarding that yeah d i mean definitely i i think that um i mean overall i i i think that at times that the sisters had some reasonable things that they were saying i think that uh, they always have to be has to be acknowledged that um the concern with um issues of um, women's inclusion issues of women being able to have space that's clean and you know spacious in the masjid among other things and um, and the idea of of including women who actually may be scholars in certain types of events you know, not that I, I'm not one of those people who is um, um, I'm not bothered by an all male panel or, yeah. or an all female panel. I'm not one of those people who says it has to be 50 50 or there always has to be a sister involved or it has to be a brother involved. No, I'm not one of those people. You know, I believe that we should always pr put forward those people who are most qualified to actually be uh, in those situations. And that's not to say that all the brothers in, in a lot of these programs are. Um, um, the, uh, always qualified, you know, to be on the stage. Yeah. Uh, so I do think that we have to really reconsider that. You know, we invite people who are not perhaps, you know, you know really qualified. Just they simply have to be men. Um, but at the same time, I don't think that it's a um, a uh, an Islamic sort of policy or Islamic teaching that the people uh, who should that that we should be. Um, going out of our way to make sure that there's proper gender sort of representation. I don't necessarily see that, you know, in the, in the Sunnah uh, of the Prophet Islam, you know, but I see in the Sunnah of the Prophet that he placing forward those people who are most fit yeah. to be in those particular positions. All right, so it's a meritocracy rather than, you know, just based upon just simply gender, yeah. uh, you know. So, but of course, if you have people who of you know women sisters who are qualified and brothers and qualified you know we should try you know to, to do that but if it happens if it doesn't happen if it's difficult to happen then you know we should be you know we should not be uh questioning people's intentions so that's one issue the other issue I, 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 in terms of critiques i think that um that one thing was brought up about this idea of um how certain people who are given a platform in the community who like share like jordan peterson like oh videos. yeah, that and was that was you. You ever play Mario Kart? It was like a video <laughs> yeah. game. You know, plays it, yeah. you know they throw the banana. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and and I was like, okay, well, this is something that was sent to me, so I I end up defending Jordan Peterson, yeah, right. and I didn't want to I didn't want to bite because. Mm -hmm. 
I knew like there's a whole lot of nuance in this mm-hmm. uh, with related to what Jordan Peterson says. Mm-hmm. I only wanted to make sure that she understood mm-hmm. we're not the Jordan Peterson fan club. So I later right. made the right. uh, added the caveat that we were actually the, probably the only Muslim platform mm. that specifically uh, told the problematic nature of uh, anthropomor- anthropomorphology, mm. uh, the attribution of hum- uh, animal characteristics to humans. And we wanted to make sure that m- when while Muslims want to learn from Jordan, that's fine. He's got some great points, but you have to understand you can't take everything uh, with that. So that's how it was mm-hmm. just like a, something that was kind of sent towards my way and I didn't want to completely mm-hmm. bite on that mm-hmm. because it could be easily painted as as people uh, as a Jordan Peterson defense, fan club right. you know mm-hmm. right Promoters, yeah yeah, yeah I, I, but there, there but there are definitely a few issues I think are important to highlight because like one of the most important issue for me me listening to these things I, I hear people say things like okay well Jordan Peterson you know you shouldn't share him he's a he's a known mm-hmm. white supremacist you know and saying things like that that was like, completely false that's, like, not, well, that's not I mean you know and, and, it, and it tells me I, I, I smirk when I when I hear Muslims especially say these type of things and the reason I smirk is because I know they're not they're just simply parroting what their friends on the left tell them to say right you know i i i think is i find it extremely irresponsible uh and 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 lacking in in depth when i find people critique others without actually studying them right you know and so to hear that it's like well he's a white supremacist i say well based upon what i mean show us show, give us a quote from him you know give us something that he did that proves he was a white supremacist you know and, and i'm quite sure that that sister or anybody else who actually says that couldn't give it to you you see so um and, and there's, again, that, and there's it, that one picture that's floating around <laughs> social media where he's holding he's he apparently put his arm around some fan who's wearing a i'm a proud islamophobe, islamophobe right? t-shirt yeah. mm-hmm. and what a lot of people don't understand is that mm-hmm. these pictures are taken after <coughs> um, a performance yes. or a speech mm-hmm. he's not even looking at Look people people's shirts, well, right? people yeah. shirts and mm-hmm. i guarantee you mm-hmm. he even once uh, he got in trouble for some guy uh, wearing one of those Pepe the frog yes. shirts yes right and he he he, he I don't think he mm-hmm. even knew that what the mm-hmm. reference was to that frog. Apparently, it's like a white nationalist mm-hmm. symbol, and a lot of people try to, you know, completely discredit the work. Mm-hmm. You read the book, mm-hmm. 12, or, 12 Rules of Life, you don't see anything related to mm-hmm. white nationalism. Mm-hmm. There may have been some fans mm-hmm. of his that are um, white nationalists, but mm-hmm. people, nowadays, it seems like everyone's yeah. kind of merging into everyone's uh, spaces, yeah. and, and I don't see how you could... Mm-hmm. Completely discredit someone's work based right, on right. that. I mean, I, I, I have things I disagree with uh, Dr. Peterson on. I mean, I mean, I have critiques for him of, yeah. of him, you know, and I have, and I don't agree hundred percent with everybody that I know, right? You know, I have disagreements with Sheikh Hamza, with Imam Zay, with Dr. Hatt. I mean, we, we, you know, hundred percent, Dr. Jackson. I mean, we, you know, and but just because you share somebody's videos that may actually you find to be useful, right? One doesn't necessarily mean that you agree with everything that they believe, and then two, it doesn't mean that you even agree with 100 percent of what you was actually in the video, mm. right? Yeah, but it's that it's just the whole idea. Just that listen, here's a particular perspective that may be of use to our to our community, and 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 it, and, and furthermore, when you if you listen to it, you absorb it. At least if you disagree, you can disagree. B- based upon an informed, you yeah. know, it's an informed disagreement. It's like I actually listened and heard, and now I have this critique. Yeah. And then we can talk about your critique. Is your critique a valid critique or not? You know, but you're going to you just say, okay, because the person was in the picture or, or said something critical of Muslims or Islam, or perhaps even the Prophet, right? Yeah. You know, then it's like, okay, that in itself is reason enough to say, you know what, everything he says, it, I can't listen to anything what the person has to say about this about this thing you know but uh, it's it's a, it's really a problem i see that the muslims have really placed themselves allowed themselves to be placed on the leash right yeah. of the left the left is really really uh, um um goading us forward and 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 dictating to us how to react to people on the right uh, and and in and, and into our own Muslim community, members of our own community as well. Mm. Yeah. Well, you, you saw that Dr. Yasser Qadi, and I don't mean to pick on him at all, but he actually went out of his way and he put the picture of that that uh, student who was wearing that I'm a proud Islamophobe, mm-hmm. and Jordan Pearson putting his arm around mm-hmm. him. He went after him. 
and that's fine. You know, mm-hmm. he he went to Twitter and he went after Jordan Pearson's uh, threat. You know? I did too. Yeah, you know, explain <laughs> yourself. But the thing with the, that is, mm-hmm. is that it's it's completely hundred percent fine. Mm-hmm. The problem is you don't do that on the opposite end of the spectrum because mm-hmm. it's yes. not cool to. It's mm-hmm. your your you found allies within the left, mm-hmm. and you don't want to. Mm-hmm. Um, hurt anyone's feelings because mm-hmm. now you're you're not you're no longer interested in you, your you've add addendums to Amar bin Maruf mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and you you've essentially said okay well it, this doesn't apply for this and en- this uh, this end of the spectrum mm-hmm. but for this end of the spectrum right, it yeah. does apply these are enemies same. and these are friends you yeah know? And, you know, you've decided that these are your enemies and I think that that in itself is a, a, a big problem for Muslims you know and that I don't see that to be prophetic I don't think I don't see it as being Islamic you know for us to pre uh, prejudge individuals for us to de- to decide that an entire you know, sort of slice of the population. You're talking about half of the country. Yeah. Right? Technically, yeah. you know, we've de- pretty much have declared them to be our enemies. And it's like, why? Because they support Trump or they support uh, conservative um, perspectives, which, or, and, and, and I think that really what drives more than anything else is that, that, people on the right have been critical of Muslims. And, you know, and I understand it, you know, and it's like, okay, well, but do people not have the right to be critical of Muslims at times? Are Muslims like perfect? Are we spotless? You mm. see, you know, and, you know, what what do these people really know about Muslims and about Islam? You know, you see. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. and I think it's mm-hmm. important that people don't, mm-hmm. people realize that mm-hmm. the, left's, the left has equal disagreements with muslims and they they no, have no i don't think equal uh, no, even oh, more even more, even more because they, they, the whole term liberalism is a detachment of whatever is holding you to uh whatever whatever traditions or values that you are you're holding on to you need well, to let them I, go I, I, would, I, would, I would i would i would i would say i wouldn't say call it liberalism because i think it's not so much liberal liberalism itself has some very positive aspects you know, sure. I, I don't i don't want to promote the idea that I personally am, am anti-liberal you know I do think that I mean you can Islam accommodates certain uh, aspects liberal liberal morality you know if if Muslims were in charge for instance that you know Christians would be able to you know to be Christian and Jews yeah, be Jews and, in that respect. You know, and certain things that are immoral Islamically they would be allowed to do Zoroastrians even were accommodated and I you know like for instance they had incest you know so that's those are liberal policies you know in Islam uh, uh, and so, but the idea, the problem is not with liberals as a, a as, as a, a large group, but the leftists, the extreme leftists, right. right, right, among the liberal party or with the progressives, right. You were, so it's not just liberalism itself. Um, um, but I, I'm talking about liberalism in in the sense that when you're re- detaching yourself from traditional ideas, yes, that's from yeah. that 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 mm-hmm. that end of the spectrum, because mm-hmm. in that sense, when you uh, take into account from what they are expecting society to do over the past two, three hundred years mm-hmm. is a detachment of values that are uh, might be grounded in tradition, mm-hmm. might not necessarily have any um, uh, larger, they, they may not necessarily have any uh, moral frame of reference that they want, they want you to detach yourself from Right. Any, anything from that, traditional yeah. morality, you know, they want to detach you from from traditional morality, from Abrahamic morality, right? Yeah. So, it's, 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 and of course, liberalism is a lot of things, you know, more than what we we're talking about. Now, and um, but but I do I do think that we have to constantly make the distinction between moral liberalism, conservatism, and political uh yeah. conservative conservative conservatism and and liberalism, <laughs> right? uh, and um, you know so. We don't. We can. We're Muslims are largely morally conservative, right? Yeah. But that doesn't make us politically conservative, and because of being morally conservative, that in itself makes conservative conservatism a bit much more a, a appealing to many of us, right? And so, like myself, you know. So if I, for instance, am sharing things by conservatives, it's because I agree with their moral stance, not yeah. necessarily with all of their political stances, you exactly. see. And, yeah. you know, so I could, like, for instance, I share quite, quite a few people, you know. I, I'm able to deal with, uh, like, for instance, the fact that, okay, a Ben Shapiro, we know he's a Zionist, you know, that he supports the Zionist yeah. project, you know. I can share his his views on abortion or, or put, like, his arguments about abortion or against right. abortion or his arguments relationship to transgender 
in transgenderism. You know, I think he's very articulate. He articulates his position very, uh, very well on those points. But yeah, I know. Or even he, like gun control and right, things like that. Control, he, he's, right. he's got very good right. arguments for right. that. But that doesn't mean that you know I'm 100 percent into Ben Shapiro's camp. Maybe, mm. uh, maybe I like 20 percent of what he says, and, yeah. and I'm like, hey, you know what? These are fantastic arguments for. Well, what I believe in, and I mm -hmm. I feel like they support. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that I'm I'm all of a sudden supporting Zionism or anything else. Right. Yeah. I yeah. always encourage our listeners to try to get the best from everyone. Mm -hmm. Don't become a, a a flag waver of of anyone. Even if the even if the Madam looks, uh, you don't you don't like something we say. Hey, let us know mm -hmm. in the comments below and. Just make sure you don't use foul language, you know, and and yeah. <laughs> come come so with an expectation. Yeah, let's, let's talk, talk about, about it. You know, it. Yes, but but that's but that's not what people want to do. See, and and, this, and Muslims have adopted adopted the same leftist tactic, is that listen, we don't like what that imam or that scholar says. Oh, we got to shut him down. Yeah. We have to put him on a blacklist. We can't invite him, disinvite yeah. him. You know, from this they event. Have that his event. Job. Right. Yeah. But yeah. I try to make. I, actually, I've had somebody try to do that to me as well as a tuna. You know, I posted something a couple from years few years ago, and then somebody sent an email to Imam Zaid and some other people and they didn't you know it's like you know, trying to get me my get me lose my job but alhamdulillah but you know we have <laughs> support from my from our from our scholars and those who who, who, who lead us and um, yeah I've been people attempted to get me disinvited from certain events um, um, like recent a recent event early this year down in LA um, both sisters um, were told from the Women's Mas and the Fitna group, Fitna group, right? They don't know anything about me, right? Realistically, they don't know me at all, and they sent contacted the group. The um, as a matter of fact, Dr. Jackson's wife, who has her Muslim psychology project, and uh, and they asked that both myself and Imam, and Imam Zay be disinvited. You know, oh wow! To, to the event, right? You know, so it's like, well, okay, what's the Imam Zayd is on the blacklist now. Yeah, Imam Zayd. He, he got the blacklist after uh, yeah, his khutbah. Was a, yeah, khutbah yeah right. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. I remember, like a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. So, so no, no one's safe anymore. These, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. it well, doesn't matter. You get thirty years for the community. Yeah. You mm -hmm. give one khutbah, they don't like. It's over. They already have their sheikha. That's why. So <laughs> that, sheikha. The, 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 their their sheikha <laughs> is apparently the the new leader. That that that's what they were really upset about. That oh. You didn't. You were saying this whole time uh, during that episode with the, with Fitna. They were mm -hmm. saying that you know you didn't say. You, you were keep on mentioning the fact that there is no scholar on on the, the Fitna's creators, or they didn't have a, a board uh, where where they incorporated some kind of scholarship, and there was a scholar sitting right there with you, and you didn't refer to her as a scholar. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I wasn't talking about that kind of scholar, but <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't want to, I didn't want to engage. More. But see, is that's a dilemma, man. If you don't have, um, if if you don't have a uh, criterion of truth that you always use um, uh, to for your moral compass, you're subject to change all the time. You're going to be changing every five years. And well, I think they do. I think they fall. do have one. They have a criterion. They have moral uh, foundation. I mean, they have uh, their epistemology. Would say again, the source of their truth and their and their morality. But it just happens not to be Islam. Yeah, it's not Quranic. It's not prophetic. You, you understand? They would. Yeah. They, they think that they're that they're do, they're doing it based upon a prophetic way of, of looking at things but the very fact that they are antagonistic towards yeah. classical scholars they're antagonistic towards the, tr the tradition you know i yeah. mean they actually are you know even if they may claim otherwise you know and so what they do they, they're left to embrace what feminism they rate you know and even if you don't call yourself a feminist you know it's yeah. like that's fundamentally what you're doing you're you're embracing feminist ideology or marxist ideology and that's that becomes a source of your morality. Your, their ideas about justice, their ideas about equality, you know, their ideas about utopia. That that is fundamentally what you're, mm. what you're, what you're buy, bought into. And we're just saying, listen, you know, that we want to address these issues with you. I mean, if there are actual legitimate issues in the Muslim community, let's address those issues. But let us utilize Islam's morality, yeah. Islam's, you know, sort of. Um, way of, of 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 viewing these issues, you see, make Allah the judge, make you know the Quran the judge in these issues first and foremost, you know. But and when you again you come out and you promote non-Islamic morality, yeah. right? You know, and you based upon this idea of equality, right? And, and it's not an Islamic, you know, yeah. idea of equality. Totally, it's a leftist. Right, it's exactly. this le le leftist mm -hmm. idea of mm -hmm. trying to achieve this e egalitarian society where. Mm -hmm. 
um, at, at, there's no more power structures where mm -hmm. we're going to have um, universal income and mm -hmm. and some of these ideas might even be connected to Islam. I know yes. during some of the Khulafa, um, I think mm -hmm. we the Islamic world had reached such a, a a strong position that there were there was um, income that was distributed back to the poor mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the extent that there were very few people even to be found that were yes. considered poor. Right, yeah. Yeah. right. Then yeah. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and Umar ibn Khattab had initiated some, 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 some programs as well. So yeah. the, these ideas aren't yeah. inherently liberal ideas. They're, they're yeah. definitely um, ideas that were, were uh, at least tried and tested out in, in the past and were achieved to a certain extent. Mm. But their reference point is not Islam. Yes, they're right. trying to achieve this leftist egalitarian society yeah. where uh, you know, not not only will there be universal basic income, but mm -hmm. there will also be um, no more uh, power structures mm -hmm. where where people, yes. will, um, you know, a, a, yeah, a like, CEO and a worker yeah. will make the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. um, it, and it'll all, it, these are all like yeah. well, actually grounded in Marxism, right. you know, if you think about it. Right. And people will get things for free. You know, the people work hard and became rich and anything that you just simply take your rich people's money and give it to the people who are actually not willing to work. Right. You know, so there's a lot of those, prob those, those problems there, you know. Now, now, I mean, definitely, I think we, we have to be very careful too not to deal with this issue in the same binary term that the uh, the non-Muslims in the political realm deal with them. So, for instance, and if you look at Republicans, Democrats, that it's uh, either capitalism or socialism, right? Right, right. You know, but for us as Muslims, it's like no, it's not either or, because when we look at, like, for instance, someone like AOC, who people they made fun of her because she said that people are too obsessed with being factually correct. Then mean then be morally wrong, uh, morally <laughs> then be morally correct, right? And you know because they were checking her on some some issues, and um, and people laughed, you know. And I understand why they laughed, but also I understand what she what she was implying as well, right? Now I'm not again one of her fans, but I understand what she's trying to get at. In fund and one of the fundamental uh, issues is that if we are opposed to welfare, right, for the poor or for Main Street, then we should also be opposed to welfare for. Mar for 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 Wall Street, mm. right? And our society is one where Wall Street has is, is, has on welfare. You know, they they take taxpayers' dollars. You know, the 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 2008 collapse. You know, the money was taken from taxpayers' dollars and given to the rich, given to the banks. You know, so that's welfare fundamentally. That's socialism, right? And and you know, you can say, well, let's not call it socialism. You know, but if you're going to give it to them, then what about everybody else? And so so you're not treating us equally. So I can I totally relate to that. You know, but I just think that uh, you can't just simply discard or dis, uh, dismiss the concern by saying, oh, see, China promote socialism, right? Mm. Uh, on the other hand, I think that this idea that something inherently evil about capitalism is like, it's, 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 it's evil. I say, no, I, I don't. Or I even saw a tweet earlier today where a Muslim was suggesting that um, that Islam was anti-capitalist. And I say, well, based upon what? I mean, what do you mean? In what way? What aspect of capitalism yeah. is Islam against? I say, yeah, maybe an aspect of capitalism, perhaps, you know, but this idea as an entire theory that Islam is against yeah. it, even Marxism. I, I think that Muslims have to be careful that we completely reject Marxism yeah. because there's some, there are certain valid insights from Marxism and socialism. 100%. Yeah. And, and it, but it's more important, I think, a lot of our scholars mm -hmm. and, and people who are you know, have that that large following to inform their their listeners that hey, these are the aspects of capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the invisible hand, right? The mm -hmm. idea that greed will guide people to do good. Mm -hmm. That's one of the um, more pop. One of the things that made Adam Smith so popular among the uh, various intellectual people in in Europe. Uh, that actually got him a lot of notoriety that, you know, oh, a worker or uh, a business leader or business owner will make sure that his labor workforce will have um, their best interest in heart because it's in his interest to make sure that they're mm -hmm. well fed and satisfied. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as Muslims, we don't frame the world like that. We don't, we don't think about how uh, greed will manipulate or will be a guiding force for for right. good you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. so these are the things that i'm kind of talking about as it'll make as people Muslims hungry are. it'll make hungry for people to 
for for material good, right? That's, yeah, that's what that is. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I think I think what people get confused with sometimes is that there's anyone could benefit from it, from anything. Yes, and the manifestation of an idea later on down the road can benefit lots of people, right? right? Um, but hikmatu dalatul mu'min. Yes, jazakallah mm -hmm. khairan. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, but you know when we talk about Islamic uh, uh, economics or Islamic economy mm. what I think the confusion occurs is Muslims we see some of us may not know what you know Islamic economics is or Islamic way of dealing with money whether it's liquid assets or but Islam is based on distribution the economic uh, understanding and philosophy of Islam is based on distribution and uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala owns your wealth and um, even a portion of that wealth which is zakat eligible you know, is not even your wealth that two point five percent. You know, yeah, but but I, I wouldn't I would challenge that I and mean, that 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 perspective. I mean, um, you know, I, I think that both is, there's Islamic's um, view, Islam's view of economics is is also rooted in production. It's not only in distribution. You know, because you have that production in order to for you to have distribution. Of what, course, what are you going to dis distribute? You know, so I mean, there's the profit encouraged. Um, uh, free markets in the general, of course, not in the same way we understand it today. You know, but of there's course. there's the hadith of la yabat hadir on libad, da'un nas yarzukillahu ba'dum min ba'd. You know, the leave, you know that don't allow for a a city dweller to sell for the Bedouin, and rather leave the people alone, and Allah will provide for one yeah. and provide for them from one another. Yeah. Right. So so. It, markets existed, and the Prophet ﷺ was so, very much about encouraging people to benefit from one another's yes, wealth. And, and that's the right. key word. Right. So, so, mm -hmm. so production mm -hmm. is a portion of the Islamic economy, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. everyone could benefit from. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that mm -hmm. the the sole purpose of having wealth, number one, is, and I know this may sound very elementary, is, but Allah Subhanahu wa Taala puts certain natural resources in the world and in the ground for us for the sake of distributing that wealth according to the, where, the places where it's supposed to go and utilizing, again, that's where production comes in, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But when we talk about, let's say, zakat specifically, let's be more mm -hmm. specific, right? Mm -hmm. The reason why zakat exists, and maybe we can't call it the foundation of Islamic economy, an element of, of the Islamic economy is based on distribution, right? But the, I think the, the thing that many people have with capitalism uh, is that the philosophy itself is based on scarcity, right? That all the elements that we have, no matter what happens, we have to make sure that we possess it. Even if it's not scarce, we have to treat it like it's scarce. And we are going to do anything we can to attain those elements or those the, the, those resources. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah, both both Marxism and capitalism are materialist uh, ideologies. That materialist know? ideology, that's right. the word I'm looking right. for. Thank yeah, you. The yes, materialist yes, yes. ideology, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, you see? Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's why we can't, adopt them as if like like this is actually something that Tucker Carlson, Tucker Carlson said you know this like there's no Nicene, Nicene creed you know about capitalism that we have to accept it blindly mm. right every single principle of capitalism yeah. right you know it was a debate he was having with um with uh, um, um, Ben Shapiro on this <laughs> issue because Ben Shapiro is like 100% diehard capitalist yeah. and, and Tucker Carlson is a conservative too is like yeah, no yeah. so you know that sometimes the government needs to intervene to, to protect people you see I actually uh, want to watch I'm glad you bought that I've, I've been seeing that yeah. on my side feed on YouTube for a while I'm like I, I gotta watch this I gotta watch that I didn't see that the, the fact that you're quoting Tucker Carlson <laughs> is more ammo for them to put you in the uh, alt bro uh, box. well actually so th there's a big differences between the two uh, there's um, Ben Shapiro's from the neoliberal neoclassical liberal camp, camp. Mm -hmm. they're, they're more into the um, the ideas of libertarianism very mm -hmm. low yes, right. Gov low amount of government intervention try yes, to right. get the mm -hmm. government um basically out of All every of aspect matters, of yeah. your life and right. they should be really a skeleton mm -hmm. uh, form i think th there's a lot that could be talked about that and i don't want right. to kind of sidetrack that but right. yeah. uh, well, speaking of that we were uh, last night we were talking about how uh, you were asking me like what box you think people put you in and I was like, I always thought he was a Maliki, but I guess. Like, <laughs> Are you a Maliki? Yes, I we am. got another one. Oh my God! <laughs> introduction. One He's after another. You didn't hear me? Uh, he was asleep that point. I was setting up the. You know, I, I got other production yeah. things I'm doing while you guys are talking and said, having back I'm, eating bags of chips and whatever you guys do. Uh, I'm like multitasking here. Yeah. Um. The uh. The whole like alt bro or ak bro label, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, interestingly enough, we were talking about mm -hmm. how people, so like, actually someone that we know pretty well, unfortunately, see, you know, there was a, a post being shared earlier about Kara Columbus uh, received the hate letter, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Talking about how somebody was like happy about New Zealand and they would keep watching the video on repeat, mm -hmm. etc. Right. So, um, somebody posted something like, "How do you Ock Bros feel about this?" Mm -hmm. right. I'm <laughs> like, 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 it doesn't make any sense. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. first of all, the Ock Bro, like people ask, like I was asking me, or they call us Alt Bros or Ock Bros. Mm -hmm. Now, more alt I know, Muslims, yeah. Alt Bros, mm -hmm. more embraces it, but I think I don't think there's a definition. Mm -hmm. it, it's like someone else created this label, mm -hmm. right? There's been other like platforms yeah. talking about it. But yeah, I think nobody... it started with Medina Medina Institute. Right? They had a program that, and they, they sort of mentioned that word. You know, it came really? up with this term, the Medina Institute. Or like yeah. with centers around toxic masculinity, <laughs> and then it's like part of the elements are like aligned with the all right, toxic masculinity, mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. Um, and so it seems like you you believe you've been suckered into that box, mm -hmm. right? Well, I, I wouldn't consider myself suckered into anything. I mean, it's it's like I see I'm intellectually independent. Meaning, and, meaning and, they're labeling and, you that way, it's right? Not, yeah, yeah. That's how again, they want to label you, but right? I've never been been bothered by labels, you know. Okay. And that's one of the reasons why I've been able to operate the way that I've operated, you know, because yeah. like for a very long time. Um, I've been marginalized by many different groups, you know, you know traditionalists and, you know, where, you know, of course, Salafis and, and others. And, and it's because I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm not, um, I'm not a, a, an ideologue. I'm not a person that um, surrenders to groupthink easily, right? Or generally I don't put it like that, you know. So anytime I feel like someone's trying to force me to think a certain way, I just, I shy away from it, you see. And and so so I'm intellectually independent in that particular fashion, and because of being that way, I get marginalized. You know, by oh, multiple same here. Right here. So this is what this is what we try to do too. Yeah. We we try to be uh, mm -hmm. friendly with everyone, and then we end up not having any friends because everyone's <laughs> like, "Well, you ball, how, why are you giving him a platform? Why are you giving mm -hmm. her a platform?" Yes, yeah. I'm like, "Come on, dude! Like, we're mm -hmm. we're trying to have discussion. We're trying mm -hmm. to build more unity. We're trying to get the trying best idea. Trying yeah. to heal the community. Trying to heal yeah. the world to an extent. You yeah. Know? So it's you have to have conversations. You have to interact with people. You have to understand yeah. people right. and and speaking yeah. of healing one of the reasons why i was excited mm -hmm. when you were coming on is there's very very few people that i know of mm -hmm. and even in the muslim world that have translated works mm -hmm. or since we're talking about healing mm -hmm. is you chose a book mm -hmm. by ibn rajab mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. very few people talk about there's usually mm -hmm. people talk about imam ghazali's works all mm -hmm. those works are beautiful yeah. but very rarely do people talk about this book which mm -hmm. is very elementary because we're talking about healing mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. And um, careful, still about to check out. You're talking about academic stuff again. No, no, this is not academic <laughs> at all. This is about tazkiyat. This is about tazkiyat and nafs. This is Tim's favorite topic. Right? Something about Marif. So, the and Marif is the name of the book. But why did you choose to translate that book? I'm glad that you did, but nobody talks about that book or even Ibn Rajab. As well, they talk about Ibn Rajab, but that book is almost considered in the English-speaking world a very rare thing. Yeah, it is. So and what actually, made you gravitate towards this? This was actually a, a chapter from the book, and the book, the book itself is focused on recommendation, recommended acts of worship throughout every single month of the year, mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know, you fasting, think? special fast, spe special prayers, among other things, uh, on each particular Islamic month. And the book, Imam Zay gave me the book some years ago. May Allah preserve him, mm -hmm. and. Um, there's this one section called Khitam al Am, you know, ending one's year, right, the end of the year. And when I read the chapter, and I was just floored by it. And then I say, I got to read this again. I read it a second time. And in Arabic, I feel like it reads even better. It, it's, it's more impactful. You know, yeah. it, it's, it's it really, you know, in Arabic it, it is. And I said, you know, I, I have to translate this. And, and and so it was just one of those type of that I just something that I just felt I needed to share with people yeah. that particular chapter. Um, and the thing was funny was that once I finished the translation, I sent an email to Sheikh Hamza. I said, Sheikh Hamza, I said, uh, you know, look over this and see what you think, you know, because I'm I'm planning to to publish this. And and he wrote me back immediately and he said, you know, Subhanallah. I said, I was just thinking about death this morning. Subhanallah. Right? So um, it's um, you know, it's a a reflection an important reflection and, and just seeing like stories from people who actually are dying, great people who are leaving this world and the, uh, the sort of concerns that they had, uh, the sense of certainty that they had leaving this world. I just feel that those are uh, just one of, of, of a number of proofs, greater proofs of God's existence, of, 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 of 
you know, the, the, the fact that the people that we know who are righteous themselves, they left this world with such a certainty. I do think that those are things that reinforce a person's faith yeah. uh, in the religion. So, so yeah, it was, uh, it's a book that, you know, you just read every year, re realistically, because again, every single month is something new. Yeah. And anytime you, you're looking for a chutzpah, it's like, well, you know, what month is it? You, yeah. you go to the Ta'if Ma'ad, or yeah. if you open it up, it's like, well, okay, yeah. And just to be more things. detail yeah. of what of what the Sheikh is mentioning, <laughs> look, I have that book on my phone, I have that PDF on my laptop, <laughs> I have, so when I was looking through <laughs> what you translated, I was like, wow, this is the only guy I know that's actually <laughs> translating this book in English speaking in the English speaking world right uh, the Arabic version which the one I have is about 670 something pages mm -hmm. you know the PDF is about 600 something pages mm -hmm. but the way the book is broken down it's genius yet so elementary mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. talks about every single month of the Islamic calendar mm -hmm. and what you should be doing Talk, starts off with kind of the virtues what you should be doing and then he comes to Rajab and Sha'ban and mm -hmm. Ramadan and we can get into because you have mm -hmm. some videos online mm -hmm. how to prepare for Ramadan and make right. the best of Ramadan for mm -hmm. my class what I'm doing is I made uh, we started towards the end of Rajab and I told my students I said we have to build some anticipation for Ramadan mm -hmm. and preparation for Ramadan physically uh, spiritually emotionally you know and socially and only then will you understand why Ramadan is important you're going to get a mm -hmm. glimpse of its importance so mm -hmm. what I did for my students I want to make it very very simple as far as preparation, I think anyone can follow this. For the, so there were there was five weeks, six weeks left till Ramadan started when I started this program with my students. I said for this one week, only keep it very simple. Don't exhaust yourself. Just read one minute of Quran a day. But you have to check in at one minute. Mm -hmm. So if you're sleeping and you forgot to read your one minute, you have to get up and you have to read one minute. Mm -hmm. Now this is not meant for the vet, the person who finishes the Quran every. It's meant for somebody who, for instance, is your first time in an Islamic school, you've been in a different type of school in your whole life, maybe you can't read Quran properly. So I said, then the second week is two minutes, three minutes, but when we get to Ramadan, it's going to be five minutes or six minutes, depending on when you started. Throughout all of Ramadan, the only extra thing you're going to do is read six minutes all the way throughout, or five mm -hmm. minutes all the way, but it has to be every day and consistent, yes. mm -hmm. right? And what I had them do is, and please don't take what I'm saying out of context to the listeners, but what I had them write in bold, I said, I don't have to finish the Quran in Ramadan. I had them write it all in bold in the capital letters, mm -hmm. meaning that I talked to them in retrospect. I said that if you start off Ramadan with one juz and you haven't read an entire juz the entire year and you're going to start, the last thing you want on the third or fourth day is have animosity towards that ibadah, the active mm -hmm. ibadah. That's mm -hmm. much more catastrophic right. than you just reading one minute. You're like, dude, that was it. I'm done. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. Imagine how much khushua that person is going to have in two, two, two minutes. Mm -hmm. exactly. So, that, so yeah. that was my principle behind it. Yes. So please don't say that I'm not no, telling people to finish sounds the like, It sounds similar to the man who came to the Prophet ﷺ. Yes. You know, what if I pray only the five prayers yes. and the fast Ramadan? You know? yep. And the Prophet, well, I get to Jannah and say, yeah, you will. You'll you know? definitely go to Jannah. You know, if understanding, you if that man, and we know if that man did that, that it's likely that once he developed that norm, that he added something yes. something to that. No, he's going to be climbing in his yeah. ranks too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's about starting mm -hmm. off very small. Exactly. Right? And mm -hmm. I said, you know, just try to fast Monday or Thursday or even the three days of the Islamic calendar, 13th, 14th, and 15th, mm -hmm. um, to get ready for Ramadan if you've been fasted all year. Make up your fasts. Mm -hmm. Some people are like, after. I said, just make those fasts up in preparation for your Ramadan. Mm -hmm. But don't burn yourself out because of Ramadan um, because we want to stay consistent with that five minutes throughout, right? Mm -hmm. So the first, the, 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 the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm -hmm. works, subhanAllah, I started looking into Ibn Rajab's book for, you know, Rajab and Shaban. And then we were having you on as a guest. So I was looking you up and I was like, oh my God, he's translated a portion of his book, <laughs> right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works in amazing ways. So that book is very dear to me and because it's so simple. He breaks mm -hmm. it down. Like no one ever thought about having these chapters and break it down by the month mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. Islamic calendar, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So chapter is going to be Rajab, chapter is going to be Shaban, Ramadan, Shawwal, Al Qa'dah, Al Hijjah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, this is Ibn Ibn Rabbi Ibn, Ibn, Ibn Rajab al Hamari. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and do you know if you're going to be doing any other translations of that book soon? Uh, not in time soon. Actually, uh, I have this year. I have three books. Well, actually, I have a reprint of the Ibn Rajab book. You know, okay. I, I, I entitled I titled that section uh, "Tears of the Yearners for the Meet yes. for the Meeting with God," uh, but there's a UK publisher, Claritas 
which actually really just awakening revamped. You know, I don't know if you awakening oh, yes, media. Yes, yes, yes. Right? I used so to go to Sami Yusuf yeah. and Yusuf Islam. I mean, um, Sami Yusuf and uh, Maher Zain. Yeah, um, Hassan, Maher Zain, Hassan, right, yeah. yeah, the Hassan was yeah, the right. founder. Yeah, I think so, right? Right. So, yeah. um, uh, I'm sure he's been uh, been uh, and um, so so they they are back into publishing now. So they uh, so this is one book that they're. Re reprinting it's actually already been reprinted uh, I have a, 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 a translation of Ibn Taymiyyah's Raf al-Malam Adin al the uh, you know, which is entitled The uh, the Def In Defense of the Four Imams by Ibn Taymiyyah uh, which actually also came out this year and then a another work which should be out next week uh, entitled uh, The Negro in Arab Muslim Consciousness you know which and all is, these which are available where are these books? with Claritas you know with okay. the UK publisher you know so um they uh so 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 th this last work is an original work of mine you know the others are translations uh so um so i i write quite a bit <laughs> i've written That's quite a awesome. bit over the years as well you know so yeah but in terms of ibn rajma's book um i don't have any plans like soon to to uh to translate any sections of it um but uh, i have a number of projects uh, that in mind that there's some pro things I've been working on for a number of years, like with related to relations to marriage, some related to Islamic um, uh, like commercial transactions and things like that. Yeah, you know, so I hope to be finished by maybe summer. We're, we're trying to get uh, Sheikh mm -hmm. Hamar to mm -hmm. participate a little bit more in the translation mm -hmm. community. Translation community. <laughs> <laughs> he refuses to get involved. I don't no, know. No, you should. You should. No, I don't. I don't refuse mm -hmm. to. Maybe I'm. Maybe maybe Sheikh uh, Abdullah here can uh, get you involved. Put you to work. Don't, don't, don't give me, please. You don't want me uh, on your team. Trust me. Don't but give him as, any goals. As, as I think that's what the first way. It's the first thing you start off with. Start off with that. No goals. I don't have to no finish pressure. The book. I don't have to finish the translation. But your writing time, like, do you have a specific? I know this may be a little off topic, but what is your uh, methodology of writing, and how do you choose uh, timings to write, and you know, generally. I mean, it's not so much about choosing times. It's 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 more like if I just have an, an opp a moment and if I'm inspired, and I just just jump on something, you know. So, um, so so let's take Ibn Rajab's book for instance mm -hmm. that you translated a portion mm -hmm. of. Yeah. Um, so you just had this, you loved it, and you just made it a project that that's yeah. gonna be your yeah, main just project. Yeah. that moment after reading it, and I said, you know, I, I just have to do this. So d yeah. how long did it take you to translate that portion? Well, to the extent that I wanted it in the up to the uh, you know you saw first draft, second draft, mm -hmm. third draft. It probably would have been a few weeks before oh, I got so before, before like I got that. it okay. before I got it where I wanted it to be. You know because um, generally what you know the first translation you just whatever you know it's very rough and and then you clean it up and then you have other people read it. And okay, the, and then you um, try to give it. a... So it's just a, when you're inspired, you just mm -hmm. try to try to finish it as soon as possible. And yeah, you kind of revolve yeah. your mm -hmm. weeks around that writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. right. I right. see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So depending on the size of the actual work, you know, because some works are going to take work longer naturally. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you have a specific method of, mm -hmm. of kind of secluding yourself in writing or timings of the day that you choose for writing. And, well, you know. I, well, at nights are, are, are probably nights and mornings are best for me because mm -hmm. and weekends uh, as well, and especially when everybody's asleep. Oh, that's yeah. the best. <laughs> yeah. That's the yeah. best. Yeah. Just, uh, mm -hmm. Or sometimes you just send mm -hmm. the family away and <laughs> like, hey, here, here's some money. Mm -hmm. Go have yourself a good mm -hmm. time. And then yeah. you get to actually mm -hmm. um, do some work and mm -hmm. actually create some outlines. Right. And Yeah, because once my son wakes up, it's like I can't concentrate <laughs> on. No, you can't. Area. People don't realize how <laughs> yeah, hard yeah, everything yeah. gets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's the, uh, so you talk about Ramadan prep. It's, it's my theory that sometimes people um, – it's based on personal experience that if you just um, if you don't really prep for Ramadan, even if you have like a, a Ramadan where you do a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. you will revert back to the old habits immediately. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's there's no build up in mm -hmm. the previous months. Yeah. And that, that's my theory because that's pers that's my personal like mm -hmm. like I feel like last year I had like like the I had like ten days itikaf and all that stuff, mm -hmm. and then like the next week I saw Sim and I was back to normal. <laughs> uh, but people don't realize man just just the preparation the easiest type of prep is just 
a simple dua which can take you two seconds of Ya Allah let me reach Ramadan mm. that mm. mentally gets a person prepared right mm. that's yeah, what I told my yeah. students too you don't have to do tons of you don't have to pray to start praying to Hajj now just make every day the dua which takes two seconds is that Ya Allah let me reach Ramadan right mm -hmm. and that itself builds the mind and certain it, it changes your body too you know I mean mm -hmm. you, the prep is paving the way for preparation yes. and it's so simple yeah, you know, and, and, Sha and Sha'ban is the you know month of warm up as well. So yeah. in preparation, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he so, as we know, he fasted Sha'ban more than any other month outside of Ramadan. Yeah. So so I don't yeah. know about y'all, but like um, fasting for me has been is because some people say, they say the first couple of days and then it's, it becomes like normal and mm -hmm. you actually are more effective. Mm -hmm. I actually haven't. I've never found that to be true for myself. Really. Um, yeah, because I'm still like dog tired and dragging and like have like brain fog. Like, well, you you your the whole Taravi schedule. You you travel to the city. You, you're doing a lot of, right after you break your fast. So I think you're just you're just kind of burning yourself out. Like maybe not, you should stay local. Yeah, Overexertion. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. But like when I come home, I'll take a nap. No, when yeah. I come home, I'll take like those 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 Ramadan naps for like two to three hours. It's like you feel like you woke up from the grave. <laughs> <laughs> you know, from the, like I it's different. It, like, it, yeah. it, it, it's like a different <laughs> like um, no. It, it's it's a very unique nap. The yeah, feeling you get when you wake up. So are you saying it's a good nap or a it's bad a good nap, nap okay. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So like, what I'll do is um, I'll get I'll go to work around seven thirty eight. I'll usually try to leave as early as I can, come home and then crash until like iftar time. And then like last like last year, I was like eating iftar because we, we have a sheikh here, Sheikh Faisal. He's uh, from. Uh, no, no, not the Jamaican cat from the UK, but like <laughs> <laughs> not that one from Somalia. Yeah. From Somalia, th this guy, in my for me personally, he's like got the most. He's a he got the nicest karat out of anybody. In the world. I'd rather listen to him than anybody else in the world. He's got a very sweet voice, man. Right. Mm -hmm. So he's local. He's like forty, in a, but it's like a forty minute drive. So I would drive up there even on weekdights, and I get home at like midnight, twelve thirty, <laughs> one a.m. Then wake up in like three hours to like for Sahur or whatever, and then go back to sleep. So. Maybe maybe Sims got a point, but I also feel like during the day the fast is like, like yeah, I guess sometimes you get the second win, but wait, aren't you Maliki and you're considered a traveler? You're doing you have to fast. <laughs> no, because is, remember what he was saying to us in the previous episode. Yeah. He's like, I'm 28 miles is is the, is our limit, and you, you know, and no, but, but I I I'd have to exit my city bot before Sahur, right? No, you, uh, yeah, no, you're you're traveling, you're Maybe traveling. Fully, you talking about for, for yeah yeah, exactly. yeah, you, correct, yeah you actually have to exit yeah. my, I, oh. I i'd have to leave i i couldn't just keep <laughs> you know no. because well, well, no because in in the, in the malik if i understand correctly mm -hmm. if you start the day fasting even if you're traveling mm -hmm. later that day you don't break it right. is that right yeah it, you, you shouldn't you shouldn't break it yeah it's, it's actually recommended too fast you know right you know, it's, it's, yeah while, right while you're yeah because like while you're you, traveling you're yeah. traveling because yeah. mm -hmm. because i'm at suhor time i'm not traveling mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. you follow what I'm saying, so that's mm -hmm. why it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. it, 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 but you don't have to naturally too fast, you know. But but again, the idea is if you're going to, we'll put it like that. If you want to take advantage of the uh, permissibility, per, 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 permissibility not to fast, yeah, but while you're traveling, then you're you're supposed to leave before for um fajr right right, right. uh and if you don't then yeah you know, right over it and, and yeah but i believe i, I believe there's a there's an opinion in the humbly school that allows you to sort of start your fast what's the which uh school is it or which mm -hmm. scholar was it who said that wherever your time is or, or location uh, whatever is considered traveling in that time and location or your period of uh existence or cultural context oh yeah cultural cultural context that if you consider that traveling, that's considered traveling. What amount of versus not versus like not mileage? Because like because yeah, that's what I follow, and I I think that's the most reasonable opinion. <laughs> and I think that you know if if I if I go to the city from here to Chicago, it's over almost 30, 32 miles or something like that, and that would be considered traveling, and I wouldn't have to fast or I can take my liberties with the rum with the. Juma and whatever you know, well, all the stuff that Mahin does basically. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I, I feel oh, like that's the, that's not that's not the that's not the spirit of the law of of what traveling is considered. And 
I don't know. I know we're kind of going off a tangent, but I, I thought it's a fun debate mm-hmm. to, yeah. because I like to poke in, in uh, mm-hmm. some magic. He, he, he's, just, my, he's just jealous. No, I, no, I just think you guys are not taking. You're not. You're not embodying the spirit of the law. Hey, <laughs> he messes with it too much. He said it in front of Sheikh Hamza. Sheikh Hamza, it, 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 bring it, man. I'll, t- I'll come straight to his face. I, 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 I make it up by washing my feet in public sinks <laughs> <laughs> and not wiping over socks. Oh. <laughs> no, so, well, so, so let's I wipe for her shoes. I'm gonna throw you. I'm gonna throw you under the bus here. Yeah. So just for fun. So, Go ahead. So, mashallah, Sheikh Hamza Makhul, mm. he jokes around. He's got a very interesting sense of humor when it mm-hmm. comes to ulama and scholars mm-hmm. he doesn't joke around right yeah right. so what sim says is to mahin he's like man sim, he's like he's making fun of mahin in front of his sheikh who's sheikh Hamza Mahbub. he's like man mahin just is maliki because malikis do everything half you know when it's salam they do it half when they do everything <laughs> half and Hamza Mahbub, he made it serious he was i was laughing kind of Hamza Mahbub just looked at him with the death stare i was like oh boy. <laughs> about to get, get his head chopped off huh? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, he 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 calls it the madhab of Malik. I'm yeah. like, wait, why isn't the madhab of Hanbal and the madhab of Abu Hanifa? Mm-hmm. How why is it called madhab of Malik? Yeah. Like as if it's like it has like a grand stature to it. You know how he always refers to it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I it's, it's much refer- more, or, or, or like even Mufti Abu Layth, it's like the, the school of Medina, like right. Yeah. So yeah. like it, the, the, there's definitely that kind of. Oh, yeah, we, we, when you call it the Imam of Medina or the School of Medina, you automatically place a kind of like yeah. regal like authority it does, to it, right? It, it does, though. People, you know? mm-hmm. when, one mm-hmm. thing that all the Madahib submit to the fact that Imam Malik is right. the Imam of Zal Hijra, Imam of right. Al Medina, there's, there's no way around that. And he has that honor. Right. And obviously, Allah places people in that honor, right? In that, in that place. There's a reason for everything. But Imam Malik, it's always, always going to be hats off to him. The Madhab of mm-hmm. Ahlul Bayt. That's next. No, no, Al-Bayt. <laughs> it depends what you mean by Al-Bayt. <laughs> so I, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, like, this is like, I don't know, this is a completely different topic since, and I, I kind of briefed you before I was going to ask mm-hmm. you, since you're with Zaytuna College, mm-hmm. and you actually alluded to, you actually didn't know this, your family had a background with the Nation of Islam. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Remember- a few months ago, uh, there was a program uh, about the, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, right, mm-hmm. at Zaytuna. Mm-hmm. And people, even I was like, man, this is whack. Why, why, why are they honoring this dude? This dude is like... You know, they're like yeah. Qadianis and yeah, Isna. Yeah, they're the equivalent of Qadianis. Yeah, right, yeah. right. So um, now, great. Now, some people will say, "Well, they're responsible for a lot of the convert. They're, they're like a, they were like a path. They were like a conduit to Islam." Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I, 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 I can buy that. Like Qadianis don't have don't have that. Qadianis are I, there. Are, there are some Qadianis that, that do revert back to Sunnism, but, 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 but I don't think Qadianism is a conduit to Sunnism. The no. way the it nation could, was. It could be. Yeah, it mm. could be. You know, I mean, it, it's not at the level. In... It's actually caused people to leave Islam and then come back, uh, maybe a generation or two later after uh, certain, um, they, after they met the right people and helped them show the way. Because I, I know think, there's I a think lot he's of talking about as far as the rate is yeah. concerned, yeah. especially in Chicago with Sheikh Warid, with the uh, Wazi Muhammad mm-hmm. and, yeah. and and stuff like that. But so, yeah. but like the whole yeah. thing about, and I understood it. At, like I, I, I usually don't say stuff on Twitter or Facebook. But even that, I was like, Cheryl, like this is this is this is outrageous. You know what I mean? Um, but then I I forgot somebody was saying, well, the honorable Eli- maybe um, I heard on from one of the Zaytuna props on another like show. They said something mm-hmm. about how the honorable is just like um, a title. It's not really where we think he's honorable. Um, but are we under like what? I, I know I know and I know you were involved in that program specifically, but mm-hmm. like. What institution? Now you guys are also all at a university or a liberal arts college. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So talk about that too, because yeah. I think people are conflating that a lot of things there. How do we, when we right. see an event like that? How do we process that? Right. Well, the first thing, as you as you mentioned, that uh, I didn't have anything to do with the program personally. Um, of course, people that I know were connected to the program. Uh, second of all, the, my understanding about that program was that it was not a Zaytuna program, that it was a program being held at Zaytuna uh, by some individuals that we were, were friends to of Imam Zaid and friends of, of Zaytuna and um, largely African-American um, members of the, well, former members of the Nation of Islam were actually followers of Imam W.B. Muhammad. And and um, it, that didn't mean that I didn't get any, any you know, um, messages, messages from people, you know, asking me, like, why? Why is this, is this happening? And, and but there are people who contacted me in private, and I obliged there, obliged the, uh, I responded to the, uh, the, um, the request for ex- explanation. And I offered that to begin with. And second of all, what I had offered them was that 
uh, that mainly, like you said, this one way to to look at it is as a title. You know, it's like when people when they talk about like noble Drew Ali or this noble is a title or honorable Elijah Muhammad or they say you know when people go to court they address the the judge as your honor um, um, and they speak of Congress people this year you know the honorable this and honorable that and now of course I don't generally utilize the title so when I, I when I speak about Elijah Muhammad I just say Elijah Muhammad um, but at, at the same time I think that um, you, we should also keep in mind that um, the history of African Americans in that you know, after slavery there were two paradigms that developed in the African American community. One paradigm is what some have called is a separatist national, nationalist paradigm and the other is what an integrationist paradigm. So an integrationist paradigm led by people like Frederick Douglass, you know, who basically saying that, listen, you know, that this is America is our home. We're not going anywhere. We're not going back to Africa. This is where we stand and we're going to make it work. Uh, the other paradigm actually was uh, probably started with his friend, um, um, Richard Delaney, who was actually a friend of Frederick Douglass, who actually had the different the other paradigm, which is that, listen, we separate, go back to Africa. You know, they don't want us here. You know, they, we, they, not, they don't want us to be equal to them. Um, and and so so throughout African American uh, history post slavery, um, the integrationists really were failing largely in their attempts to uh, get um, to attain equality. The the, nat the nationalist separatist perspective was um, uh, was one where they basically said that listen you know we are not trying to live together with you uh, we actually just want to separate we want to be able to thrive so so not everybody was saying go back to africa they're saying you will stay here but listen we're not trying to integrate with white people right you know right. And, and the fundamental uh difference is that they they would they would say to they would actually say to white people said listen you know we don't want to integrate with you and we just want to live a dignified existence and you know we want you to support our decision so someone like um booker t washington um who was probably one of the most he was the most popular African American uh, in the U.S. at the time um, in the early twenty, early twentieth century, who actually brought this message to white America, and actually white Americans that they were accept, accepting of that particular message, uh, and so he actually got a lot of financial support from white Americans, people from the South, people from the North, you know, to start his school. Like he had the school called the Tuskegee Institute, which is now Tuskegee University, it still exists uh, down in the South. And his idea was that, listen, the problem in America with blacks is that white people don't see us as equal. And one of the reasons they don't see us equal is because of what they did, what happened in slavery and led to us being seen as um, uh, unclean, as being, uh, um, um, you know, undisciplined and savage, things like that. You know, so he said, listen, what we're going to do, we're going to clean ourselves up. We're going to, you know, um, be, be per we're going to be good at what we do. We're going to make ourselves indispensable. And once they actually see that, they going to it will be easier for them to accept our equality to them. And once we have our equality to them, or they see us as equal, it will be easy for us to get all of these civil rights uh, mm. victories that we that ultimately. So he gave up the whole civil rights struggle for that. You see, and so the Nation of Islam sort of comes out of that paradigm. And and in the Black American community, the um, the the Nation of Islam actually has been the most <coughs> successful of all of those movements, you know, in the early 20th century to empower black people, you know, to, 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 to do for self, to, 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 to serve, to, to establish business, businesses, to clean themselves up among other things. So, so while on one hand, when we think of Elijah Muhammad and we say, okay, he, his claim of being a prophet or being sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly is blasphemous, it's kufr, right? And no one can accept it, right? And it's mm. a, a dishonorable act, right? Yes. Right. But at the same time, like for instance, I'll give you an example from my father, Lord Hummel. I remember I had this conversation with him because he was a diehard supporter of Elijah Muhammad. He actually believes that God, the creator, sent him. He was one of those people. He actually believed it literally okay. that he was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And did they believe that, that God came in the form of W.D. Fard? Yes, yeah, believe that. Yeah, so that was like almost yeah. like the similar what the Christians yeah. believe about Isa. Yeah, exactly. Right. And they used to say that of Elijah Muhammad, they used to say that you know that he was the Prophet Muhammad resurrected from the dead. You yeah, know? I heard right, him. right. So that was they actually believed that, 
And 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 I remember when and he died and Imam W D Muhammad had taken over. Well, I didn't remember it, you know, but my father told me about this. How when he, when Imam W D Muhammad took over, that in the earlier years, Imam W D Muhammad was very critical of his father, very hypercritical of his father. Just clean, said my father was wrong about this. He was wrong about that. He was wrong about this. Wrong about that. And my father, he 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 lamented this this uh, fact uh, to me one time, saying that. We followed his son, but one thing I never really could wrap my head around with him was that he was so critical of his father. He mm. didn't have to be so critical of his father that, that we would have followed him anyway, right? You know, they, I mean, Imam W.D. Muhammad. Yeah. And so my father was hurt when anytime someone spoke ill of Elijah Muhammad. And, and the reason is because Elijah was, as my father said, what he put it was that was the very first person that ever made them feel like they were worth anything, oh. right? You understand, and 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 so, and he gave them a sense of self worth. He he made them feel empowered. He made them feel fully human. He made them feel beautiful. You understand, mm -hmm. and and you know, when you when you look at the fruit of Islam, you look at the nation of Islam in that time. Even in the African American community, that when people think Muslims, even still today, when people you say word Muslims among most African Americans, they automatically think. The nation of Islam, mm -hmm. right? Even so, they it's, it's really interesting, you know, with all of the spread of Sunnism that they still sort of see real Muslims, the nation of Islam, because they see them these individuals. The guy they didn't drink, they didn't smoke, they they were clean, they they dressed clean, they spoke good English, they did not use profanity, right? Their women, they 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 took care of their 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 wives and their children, right? You know, they were leaders in their families, you know. So there was a lot that was respectable about what you know, they got people off of drugs. That people were addicted to heroin. They were helping guys get uh, unaddicted, right? Mm -hmm. You know. So there was a, a real major program that they had going on. And so when people think of like Elijah Muhammad, you know, they may say, they know that the claim of prophethood is 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 wrong. But at the same time it's it's almost like trying to ask people dis to disown their mother and father. Yeah. You understand? I hear you. Right, y'all. And, and so that is really what, what drives a lot of it, see? And, and in spite of everything, once all of the complaints came out, and I saw this uh, immediately, once it reached Imam Zaid, I think Imam Zaid probably went and spoke to the organizers and then actually changed the name. They actually changed the name of the program. I don't know if y'all saw that. No. No. They, yeah, they actually did change the name of the program and they got rid of the honorable because it's okay, it's too much controversy being caused by it. We just want to remove the honorable. You know, but again, they wanted to acknowledge that this individual decides Dr. King, you know, he wasn't Muslim either, you know, but he, there's his contribution to the black struggle or the American struggle, however you like to see it, or, or any other person in, in history, you know, so in one sense, you, it's almost like studying him as a um, sociological phenomenon or, you know, or a, something a, 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 on that level, and, but also appreciating <laughs> things that perhaps potentially we can utilize ourselves you know because if we take the position that there's nothing good to be taken from elijah muhammad this is like dr peterson or it's like you know, ben shapiro is like you understand or about yeah. tucker carlson yeah. you know because they have one opinion right that was wrong then we we miss out on something mm. that actually can help us to improve the community advance the community's uh interest do you feel that the current i don't know if you if you can comment on this or mm -hmm. not but mm -hmm. um for example i don't know if you know sultan muhammad he's mm -hmm. the imam at mosque mariam in chicago so he's and he, he'll you'll see him in a lot of like sunni events mm -hmm. right and people say well mm -hmm. that's his theology um but the nation is still part of the from the organizational point of view right mm -hmm. uh, my impression was always you know as i learned about the nation and malcolm x that they didn't really stress the theology. They weren't really gung ho about the theology. Mm -hmm. I guess they knew how to parrot it, and mm -hmm. somebody asked them. Mm -hmm. But they weren't really. That wasn't their core thing. They were more about the movement, the politics. Yes, right, exactly. right. It was, like it was, my mother used to say, she said that she never believed the stuff about mm -hmm. like, you know, the white man, the devil, and you know, whatever things. Or the spaceship. But, 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 yeah, yeah, the spaceship. You know, the yeah. mothership. Yeah. Um, and she didn't believe those things, but mm -hmm. she was again. She people were just really. Um, 
Hungry they were change. yeah they, they were looking for change they saw the unity they saw that they said, listen this is all these young people right yeah. they, they are young people you know they were getting together and everybody's wearing the same clothing everybody's talking about keeping their families together people were talking about going and starting their own businesses you know not working for the white man you know all these type of things separating from mainstream because they don't accept this anyway right not voting right so all these things sort of mobilize them and so and white 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 people call black people evil and and devils and demons. I said, no, they just did the opposite. You know, no, black is beautiful, yeah, right? Right, right? You know, you're a devil. No, we're gods. I mean, we know it's all blasphemous, you know, but yeah. that was their reaction, the way that they yeah. responded to these things. And, um, but, you know, the theological things, issues aside, the social programs, the, uh, the approach to help people to um, heal psychologically to an extent, right? Um, I think that those are things that are that are uh, admirable. You know, yeah. you know that may, yeah. who else has done that? And, and then even the theological roots of people like Elijah Muhammad as well. Right? Even you know? even like like yeah. in the fictional story, you can appreciate the plot and how everything happens. Right. I mean, think about yeah. this. I know mm -hmm. a few brothers that were mm -hmm. the Nation of Islam in mm -hmm. Chicago, mm -hmm. and there's something really interesting. I was mm -hmm. having a discussion with them like ten years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, they said if you take a people that were very oppressed mm -hmm. and you say that they were made in the image of God mm -hmm. so you take youth off the street and say that they're gods walking on earth mm -hmm. and the only thing that's holding them back was white people so mm -hmm. naturally that's the struggle right yes. devils mm -hmm. holding them back mm -hmm. so we've been succumbing to the devil destroying us but now this is your realization that you're gods walking on earth mm -hmm. I mean it's a fictional story that mm -hmm. sounds really cool yes mm -hmm. blasphemy mm -hmm. everything of course yeah but I'm saying take that away from it a little bit mm -hmm. and look how fast change was actually made. Right. So what they were saying is in this story that extreme change to take place, yeah. it had to be extreme measures. Mm -hmm. And right. that's why I think that plan right. had some type of genius to it. Mm -hmm. Not on an aqidah yes. level. Right. I'm talking about on a story level mm -hmm. to take people that were living in that situation and unfortunately taken to the level of so much servitude and felt lower than everybody else. You took them and made them into gods basically right, right. i think that's in, 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 that's a good point because i just thought of something because again the nation didn't come out of islam like yeah. elijah muhammad wasn't a muslim yeah. mm -hmm. like, there's no distinction between them and qadianis qadianis yeah. yes, like right. mirza was i guess born a muslim mm -hmm. and then eventually just you yeah. know and the followers even when sheikh hamza was on the show we talked about the qadianis like it was like a couple years ago <laughs> he was like your forefather was Ahlul sunnah yeah. you know mm -hmm. they were and then like, but the nation, their lineage wasn't maybe back in Africa, yeah. but their religion preceding was probably Christianity, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? You see elements. Right. Even with, even with Louis Farrakhan, he a lot of his style is based off of what is biblical, you know, from the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, but One thing interesting though that I've noticed um, is when you look at the ancestors of uh, Elijah Muhammad in Chicago, even. I don't know. Last time, I don't know if you had a chance. The, was Imam? You met um, Imam Omar at Masjid Fatir. Yes, right. Right. He's so he's the great. And we had him on the podcast. Well, yeah. like a couple Beautiful years. It's been, a, it's been two years, right? We got to bring him back. So he's ver like he's very like hardline against Elijah Muhammad and the nation. Right. Mm -hmm. He was like, I, I remember sometimes because I used to live in Hyde Park, so I'd go to Kutba there, mm -hmm. and um, sometimes, and he would like. I remember one time he's talking about people going to Savior's Day, and just like y'all still think it's okay to go to Savior's Day when they believe this about Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, mm -hmm. right? There's no unity with that. Like he was very, he's very black and white. But then you got someone like Sultan, mm -hmm. who's probably the, he was, the, he was actually the Imam of Mosque Mariam, mm -hmm. may identify with Sunnism, but like it's still and it's just interesting to see that dynamic how they're approaching right, things yeah. differently, right? Yeah. I don't no, know if you have and, any and again, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier in the show right. that you know the Aqidah takes a long time to yeah. you know sort of work it out. Full right? circle, full circle. You know, and again, yeah. that's my my father. Look at my father's his his struggle. I mean, it took you know he he my father used to pray in English. You know, most of his life, most of his Muslim life, he prayed in English. You know, but he became Sunni, then he started to learn the Arabic. I mean, towards the end of his life, I mean, he's, he, he, he used to call the Adhan at the Masjid. You know, I mean, but it took him a long time, you know, to get to that. You see? Yeah. So, those ingrained thoughts and, and, and feelings are very, mm -hmm. very hard to remove. Yes, mm -hmm. they're right. very, very difficult. That's mm -hmm. hence why mm -hmm. Mecca was thirteen years. It, mm -hmm. it, it had to be done, and yeah, it's it's a it's a very. Um, Interesting way of looking at things because we see mm -hmm. sometimes you talk about the older generation and say, oh, they're not going to change, you know, mm -hmm. and they're they're going to stick to their ways. And but there's a reason for that, right? Those, but think those about Sahaba. Behavior. Yeah. Think about Sahaba. Like, for instance, we have all this theological th clarity about Qadar, about you know who was the best of the Ummah, who uh, you know, I mean, uh, so many other issues. I mean, we have all this theological clarity. They didn't have it. 
Yeah. They didn't have it. All of them didn't have it. I mean, there were multiple opinions. I mean, when the Prophet died, I used to a lot of these issues didn't even exist yet, yeah, right? You know, yeah. you know, the Quran, makhluk, ghair makhluk. I mean, yeah. all these issues that came up later on in Islamic history. Yeah. Um, uh, we have this all this clarity, and we have this sort of privilege to sit back and judge yeah. you know, people uh, of the past in that way. And I'm not saying that that means that we can that we should tolerate uh people will continue to perpetuate those type of beliefs today mm. right but it's just about acknowledging that people are coming from darkness into light you know mm. and they go through phases you know right and 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 you you have to be patient with it um people don't know automatically that this particular belief or that one is wrong right away mm. and um so just again just acknowledging uh, human psychology, human, uh, I mean, the sociological um, 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 so dynamics that uh, dictate, you know, the evolution of, 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 the, of, 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 of different peoples. And, um, you know, so when you see it in that sense, it, I, I sort of see like the early proto-Islamic or the syn syncretic Islamic movements are just phases, right? And they're rooted in their lack of orthodox beliefs was because of ignorance more than anything else or because of the teachers that they had available to them you know that that okay elijah muhammad you know we i mean there's clear evidence enough evidence to say that he, he was exposed to ahmadiyya or qadiani sort of beliefs early on and you know perhaps even um you know the uh um ismaili beliefs as mm. well i mean you see those things that you know this is islam for them you know uh in the early period uh and um you know, there's a connection. You know, and as a matter of fact, my mother told me that that Imam uh, that Elijah Muhammad actually used to teach them that he said he would say to them, "Say, I'm not teaching you Islam. I'm teaching you the history of Islam. The mm. one who comes after me is going to teach you Islam." Right? You know, now, I, I'm assuming that he said that Chor is closer to the end of his life, right? As in, once he reconciled with his son W. D. Muhammad. And you know, it's sort mm. of to send this message to the people that we know that my son is going to be the one who's going to teach you real Islam. Right? And as a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Khalid Blankenship at Temple University, he he met someone who was very close to Elijah Muhammad, and he told Dr. Khalid that on his deathbed he actually, you know, took shahada. That like he actually, you know, and of course it's not a a a, a, a popular story, but he said he said I got that direct from the man's mouth and that, that Elijah Muhammad repented. He made tobo on his deathbed. You know, of oh. course that that's not what Farrakhan anyone else teaches, but this is what you know. Allah knows best. Allah yeah, knows yeah, best. Allah. You know what, wow. what, what, what occurred. So well, it's kind of like Michael, Michael Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you know the Michael Jackson story. What, how which like, how he took shahada near the end of his life and there was a janaza done. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. Well, I didn't. I didn't know about that. Yeah, yeah like they took, a, they cut away, and mm -hmm. uh, one of the one of the Diobandi Ulama who's living in SoCal at the time did mm -hmm. his janaza. So that's wrong. Yeah, you yeah, know, wrong. Uh, but uh, the thing about it was, what do you see? Do you think Farrakhan's death will signal the end of the nation, as we know it? Or yeah, yeah I think I, I I don't see anyone as charismatic as he as he as Farrakhan is, and the conditions in America is so different now that. Uh, I don't see a viable yeah. uh, movement. There's not know? enough stimuli right. to right. for it to continue. But do you think it they will then convert into Sunniism, or will it just kind of disperse like randomly? Uh, well, I think that if we prepare the ground, then many of them will convert to Sunnism. Yeah. Uh, and but, the but if we're not some... doing anything, if we're not preparing for that day. I, I think that you know that the Farrakhan's death, whenever it does happen, is potentially dangerous for Muslims in America because. At the rate that, uh, like right now, we consider people like Candace Owens and the Republican Party, the Conservative Party, who actually has been very successful in convincing a lot of uh, Black Americans to uh, to to become to leave the Democrat Party. Uh, and this is why you know the Democrats are really they're terrified of this woman, you know. Mm. And you know, I don't know if you saw the congressional hearings last week and how she really she really laid them out, you know, for trying to distort her record. Mm. But people like her and who are black Christians, and they're somewhat antagonistic, you know, towards Islam. Um, and, and and that's not new, right? There are a lot of black Christians who don't like Muslims, you know, oh, even yeah. a lot of black Muslims. You know, and Farrakhan in one sense sort of serves, what I see him as like serves as a buffer, like between, you know, the Muslim community in general, nationally, and, you know, um, 
the the black Christian community mm, because they, about they, like they, they see yeah. Farrakhan as like a, a legitimate black leader. You know, unlike they don't see Jesse Jackson that way, or Cornell West, or mm. or um, um, Al, Sharpton. You know, Al Sharpton. They don't the blacks in general. They don't see them as as, as really bona fide uh, leaders. You know, but they see a lot of blacks see Farrakhan as a a legitimate, legitimate bona fide leader. And but once he he passes, um, uh, I don't see a successor right who can mobilize people in the way that he was able to do it. Uh, and 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 if Muslims don't develop a a type of dialogue with the black um, Christian and non Christian community, uh, but is rooted in our own values as well, because with the because with the aim of trying to even help them become um, more moral and to be more successful, then there's potential of them even turning on black Muslims, right? And I and and one thing that Dr. Khaled, you know, I really respect his opinion because as a historian, uh, um, quite a bit. One thing he said years ago was that that the that the black American community actually had it not been for the fact that we have a significant number of black American Muslim converts, that the American government probably would just simply shipped out all of the Muslims from other countries a long time ago, you see, you know, and of course you see, you know, what's happening like right now, even though I wouldn't characterize Trump's efforts as an effort to get rid of Muslims, you know, um, what we call the Muslim ban, you know, which is, you know, is uh, somewhat of, um, for me, you know, I understand why most people use the term, you know, it's called the Muslim ban. I don't agree it's a Muslim ban, but it's, um, but basically I just, I think that if Farrakhan it removes his death will be sort of like somewhat of a removal of a certain type of protection that I think the national community has had, and so 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 then these Christians will move in, you know, mm-hmm. further antagonizing black black American Muslims, and then um, perhaps even more Christians black Christians to become Republican as well, right? Being mm. conservative. Right and and if yeah and that Muslims, movement has begun yeah, right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. they call it Blexit they call yeah. it the Blexit movement yeah. here yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah yeah all right just scanning through the uh, comments real quick um one of the brothers actually wanted to thank you he watched your thirty minute video on Tawil and Ibn Taymiyyah <laughs> so and then uh, Sheikh Saad Qadri is asking if there was a recording of the program yesterday. Which I don't know if there was. Yeah, or they so said they recorded sh- it. I saw a camera. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. Just uh, Sheikh Saad Qadri is listening. Salam, brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. You know, he moved out to Milwaukee, so we don't see him that much anymore. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. Mm-hmm. Anything right. else? Any, any other questions for the for the Sheikh before we um, wrap it up? Well, well, I I just had a question regarding mm-hmm. someone on. Some of the more notable brothers on, on Twitter were saying. Notable brothers on Twitter. <laughs> well, I guess uh, you know I don't want to mention thing. names, you know, but. Uh, they were saying like, oh, you know, when you when you guys invite uh, black brothers on the show, do you necessarily have to talk to them about black issues? Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, you know, some people need to know about stuff, and there's not that many um, intelligent people that I consider when when we invite people who are intelligent. You know, we invite them for a reason uh, because they can speak intelligently on many different topics. Mm-hmm. And I, I wanted your your take on on that idea that you know this this new interplay of how you know all these various identities are, are now communicating with each other not we we just talked about uh nation of islam did you mm-hmm. feel any offense to us even bringing that up with you because mm-hmm. of, i when I, when he asked you i didn't even consider your sk- skin tone but mm-hmm. apparently many people while they're watching they're seeing <laughs> brown guys indian oh guys God. Bengali guys, whatever uh, other identities we have, mm-hmm. are asking uh, and, and a black man about it. Let me just add it, on to that before. So, when we were talking about Black Lives Matter issues, they had a problem because there's only brown guys talking about it. And then when you bring somebody on that's African American, then they say, "Why are you making like feel uncomfortable?" Lead, right. I'm not saying yeah. those people, yeah. but I've heard those comments. Yeah. Why would you bring that up? You're gonna make them feel uncomfortable. I was like, "Dude, number one, we're all Muslims, and number two, we're not." Anyways, so that's that's a dilemma that right. sometimes comes about. No, I don't. I don't. I'm not. I wasn't offended. Offended at all. Yeah, of course you were. And, right. and and um, I understand where certain people are coming from when they say, okay, well, almost uh, any time we invite uh, a black person to a lot of programs, a lot of conversations that is specifically to deal with something related to blackness. You know, and that individual may be qualified. I mean, you know, again, so, you know, I teach fiqh, I do aqidah, I've, I've done usul, I, you know, I teach uh, family law, I teach inheritance. I, there's a lot of different things, the commercial law as well, hadith. There are a lot of different things I can speak to from in, in relationship to Islamic disciplines. 
Uh, but um, so I do think that that is an issue in the community. Uh, but also what comes along with that is that people don't only want us to come and talk about something about blackness. It's as if like Muslims and other people who are non-blacks want you to talk about blackness in the context of being a victim, right? And, yes, and, and so, so recently, this is actually a recent thing that happened and, and this is in the Bay Area. I was invited to a masjid to, to take part in a, a lecture series. And specifically, they asked me to come. They want me to come and talk about the, you know, black history of black America. And they want to say, want to talk about, want people to understand, you know, your, your experience in victimhood, things like that. And I responded to the individual sent me an email and I said to him, I said, you know, I'm willing to come to speak at the masjid, you know, but I am a bit bothered by the fact that you are specifically asked me to talk about that. Right. When I can, and I gave him like my like CV, it's like I, you know, all these things particularly I can talk about, you know, but, you know, but I then I chose for them. I said to him that, that I'm willing to talk about um, 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 issues of race and how the whole concept itself has led um, Muslims or Islam to uh, um, become itself a race, a race now, right, you know, rather than a religion anymore. And, uh, and so, Later on, maybe then a week, the brother had decided. He said, "Oh yeah, that's good." But then, like a week later, he said he changed his mind. Oh well, we decided and everything. It'll be better to have it another time. We'll contact you later on, <laughs> right? And I haven't received any any response, yeah. you know, um, any follow up since that particular email. So it's as if, unless I'm talking about, I'm a black. I'm just so poor. I'm so like defenseless, and I'm a victim. And the white man did this to me. The white man did that to me. You know, then. I, I'm not going to be invited you know, to, to give that conversation, to have that talk, you see. But since I brought in the issue, because it's, I see it as directly related to Muslims' alliance or sort of, I say, Muslim placing themselves under the umbrella of the left uh, and, and, and me speaking to undermine that alliance, you know, they don't want me to do that. So they decide, no, we can't bring them to that because you're going to offend our friends. You know, that's mm, the way I interpret yeah. it personally. Yeah. And so, I think there's, there's a lot that occurs yeah. when somebody's having a conversation yeah. and... Mm. We, we used to talk about mm -hmm. five to ten years ago about society thinking for you. Mm -hmm. You personally may not be offended, but mm -hmm. you're trying to be a reflection of society and you're mm -hmm. being offended based off of that. Mm -hmm. But now yeah. it's, it became even more molecular. Mm -hmm. And since you bought into some type of idea, you see that, some, we, for instance, we have a guest and we're talking to them and all of a sudden... That, that alarm goes off because society and that group that you're a part, whatever the mm -hmm. idea is, is going off. But you're creating a fake world, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to rant about those people. I actually feel really, really bad about those people. Mm -hmm. Is because you're preventing yourself from so much dynamic material. You fogged it with just this idea that's an artificial idea, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. amongst brothers like ourselves. Right. Yeah. right? And I, this is what I teach to my students too, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm sorry to keep bringing up my own teaching experience. I'm not okay. tooting my own horn. <laughs> but I tell them. It's okay, you're a braggart. Yeah, I yeah. am. <laughs> I'm a Jimmy Braggart. So. <laughs> Jimmy Braggart. 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 <laughs> so, so yeah. what I tell my students is this is alien to some children that were born, you know, that are 15, 16, 17 years old right now. I said, look. No matter who the individual is, we think at the level of Muslim brothers and sisters, whether we know them or we don't know them, we love them so much because we're bound by Allah. Mm -hmm. If they're a complete stranger to us, we are prepared to take a bullet for that person. Mm -hmm. We don't care sure. where they're from. Mm -hmm. We don't care what they look like. Yeah. You know, Allah doesn't look at those things, but Allah, mm -hmm. He made you special because of La ilaha illallah from the Rasulullah in your heart. That's right. Mm -hmm. But that comes with a pact, that comes mm -hmm. with a treaty with all Muslims. Mm -hmm. And I want our listeners to know that is our understanding of Islam. We don't mm -hmm. care who somebody is. If they say, like, even if they don't say, La ilaha from the Rasulullah, mm -hmm. you know, we heard khutbahs all the time about our neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. Even our neighbors, whether they're Muslim or not, it doesn't matter. We're, we're their protectors, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So our mindset is, it goes way beyond just some alarm going off and you thinking that we're trying to put somebody in a corner. We, uh, we, we've, we're yeah. not anywhere on that wavelength. Our wavelength mm -hmm. is much higher than that. Not bragging, is because that's pure Islam. Right, yeah. and, and I think that we have to, again, this high, whole idea that there's certain questions you're not allowed to ask. Yeah. And again, it's part of the, that general culture we're yeah. living in right now, whereas shutdown culture, the sort of safe space culture, and, and for me, I just totally reject that whole, yes, um, that whole this whole idea of, like, listen, trying to protect people from 
being exposed to certain types of issues and certain types of questions. You know, you don't create a lasting peace by shutting down conversations, by shutting down events of people who you don't like, by blacklisting people. If anything, all you do, you further polarize the community, and you actually, you, you're actually, um, you're, you're, you're. Uh, you're advocating a certain. You're going to produce violence. Violence is going to come. They're going to be a result of that. You see, because because people, you know, when they can't, when they're talking, you know, they fight. You know, that's what happens. There's no more talk now. You know, you don't want to talk. Okay, well, hey, well, I guess the only way we can make this work is like either you're going to win, or I'm going to win. We're going to fight. Yeah. You see, and and I'm afraid of that occurring, like in our society right now, that um, a race war, in like civil war level type of things, things happening like right now because of these culture wars that are going yeah. on. And I do think that, I just think that it's a, a grave mistake that Muslims have made and, and, and adopting the ideology of the left. I'm not saying, I'm not talking about Muslims working with people from the left. We can work with people to the left. I don't have a problem. I don't even have a problem working with Muslims who are LGBTQ, right? On issues that are of equal interest to us and they don't violate our morality, right? You know, but, uh, uh, but the idea, but but Muslims have gone further than that. M Muslims have embraced the ideology of the left. You know, they've embraced the tactics of the left as well, right? And they've been those things have been dictated to them about like who yeah. to invite, not to who not to invite, how to deal with these issues, these people, right? Uh, and um, and I think that that's a, a big problem. It's a big mm. problem. So and the and nothing I don't see anything really on the on the Muslims agenda, but even the political agenda that's really. Um, an Islamic, a, a you know, a a a a, a, a uh, original Islamic concern beyond like Palestine, right? Other than that, yeah, personally. You know. All right. Well, uh, Jazakallah Khair, Sheikh Abdullah. Mm -hmm. I you know appreciate you coming through on this snowy. Mm -hmm. It's like spring here in Chicago. It's, it, snow, it's supposed it, to be like four it, inches, man. Yeah, I was thinking about that. It was April. I was driving. I said, this is April and all this snow. <laughs> this right? whole like, week yeah. was beautiful weather, and all of a sudden, the snow came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. You, you know what? When Dr. Beautiful. Ali came, we had a blizzard. Yeah. <laughs> Must be the Zaytuna tuna guys <laughs> coming through. I think so. Yeah. Wow, yeah. yeah, that's true. <laughs> Zaytuna and their blizzards. <laughs> the yeah, y'all yeah, brought the snow from California. <laughs> How can people find out more about your work? They want to like engage mm. you. Where are you at? Right. Um, website's address is uh, lamposedu.org, um, or you can type type in lampostproductions.com. Um, I'm, I'm I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Um, I um, you know I largely just posts. You know, every once in a while I'll comment, but most of what what, what I'm doing in social media is posting things, and hopefully hopefully they are a benefit to people who are willing to watch the videos and read the articles. And rather, than, and I don't take people's uh, you know crit critiques seriously if they are not willing to watch or read what I post. Uh, and so when people say out bro or whatever those type of things, that's not I, don't, I just ignore it. it doesn't mean anything to me you right. know? if you if you have a valid critique then I will consider it if the, if you're not going to but you have to w listen to things you know so and so and that's what I didn't want to do a plug uh, for uh, we have an, an event next next uh, weekend in uh, Atlanta Georgia the second annual Black American Muslim Conference uh, at the um, uh, the uh, uh, something Congress World Congress Center at the uh, George Georgia World Congress Center, um, and um, a lot of uh, our notable uh, scholars from the community: Mem Siraj, uh, Dr. Jackson, and Mem Zaid, um, Sister uh, uh, Auntie Aisha Adwia, among others, who will be there in attendance on the April the nineteenth, twenty twenty first. If uh, people are around, please come through. If you would like to be a sponsor, please let us know. If you want some advertisement, you know, in our electronic brochure, if you want some vending, all those things are still available. Uh, but um, I, I definitely appreciate uh, being on the show today. And and I was saying before we started, uh, I really appreciate all you brothers. Uh, okay. Even though I don't get a chance to to listen to you all the time, uh, what I have listened to in the past is uh, uh, I really appreciate the fact that you're willing to deal with difficult di difficult issues and willing to actually sit down and have conversations with people that you may actually even have ideological differences with. All right, and I think that that's the way forward. We need to do that very much more uh, rather than you know doing what a lot of people uh, have been doing and simply ignoring and trying to blacklist and shut people down oh, okay. thank you so much for just mm -hmm. being there and and your your mm -hmm. presence on twitter mm -hmm. you know sometimes you, you want to say to yourself that you're the only one and you can stand on your mm -hmm. own two feet and mm -hmm. and say what you want to say but having people like you gives us uh, strength gives mm -hmm. us um a bank a backbone you know mm -hmm. 
to to stand up in in, in the storm, you know, and and uh, it's a new chapter of inspiration, basically. Yeah, when somebody says that, alhamdulillah. Yeah. And you made his day, man, because this guy does so much work. <laughs> he does more work on this than he does in his regular. Work. He goes to work just so he can work. On no, Sheikh, uh, 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 it's it, it's been a long time coming. I'm embarrassed that it took so long to to That's bring right. you on. This this weekend has kind of been like that. We we had another guest yesterday who was also. Uh, uh, so someone we looked up to for a while, and mm -hmm. he finally came on the show. And but we don't I want just, you to think we intentionally put you on the back burner or anything. Yeah, like that. It was, just, no, so things happen the, the way they happen. I'm glad our, 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 our following is much more bigger than it was in the past, mm -hmm. and I think this appearance will have a, a better effect than it would sure. have had in the past. Mm -hmm. So I, We appreciate Zaytuna College also for helping like us, mm -hmm. you know, get you guys in, you know, yeah. Dr. Ali oh, yeah. and, you know, yourself now, inshallah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, you know, Talk definitely. Talk to Sheikh Omar Qureshi when you go back. Oh, yes, to come on too. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that's he that's is planning to come to Chicago. So we'll yeah, wrap right. this up. Before we finish up, YouTube, like and subscribe. Mm -hmm. Tell your friends about us. We're still Patreon. on iTunes. Dude, like, give us, don't forget about the five star. I know we haven't talked about it in a while. Still want the five star ratings. At yeah. patreon.com forward slash the Mad Mamluks. For our special guest, Sheikh Abdullah bin Hamid Ali, and my co host, Sheikh Hamir Saeed and Sim, this is Mahin signing off for the Mad Mamluks. Assalamu alaikum. Oh.